Hello friends, uh, welcome to PW MedEd. Welcome to the INI CET revision series. Good evening, good evening, good evening everybody. So we have seen a couple of people have joined in do God and it's viral and fact very good. So the fact that is very viral is that INI CET is upcoming and uh, good evening Pahadi Melodies and uh, what we are going to do in this session today is I have taken some of the previous year questions all right and some are new questions that I have created keeping in mind the trend of questions in INI CET. So, the major focus areas where extra edge is required those are what I am going to discuss in today's session so good evening Shantanu good evening Shin Chan okay right so I have 30 questions for you people all right and we are going to discuss 30 questions very rapid fast session key important pointers in the different clinical scenarios right so we have clinical scenario based questions also waiting for us so let's get started without wasting any further time so let's have a look at this question this was a previous year question which of the following statements regarding estimation of gestational age is wrong okay it's calculated from the last day of lmp first trimester ultrasound is the best for estimation of gestational age date of embryo transfer is needed for calculation in IVF pregnancies or all of the above statements are wrong. So this is a very straightforward question but I did want to talk to you about uh, calculation of uh, gestational age in um, IVF pregnancy so I included this question right. So surgeon it's not calculated from the last day of LMP you know when you ask for the LMP you have to ask for the first day the day the bleeding started. So it is calculated from the first day of LMP my dear friend so that statement is wrong okay so that's you're right you're right so it is calculated from the first day of LMP but not from the last day of LMP very good surgeon and Docpedia are answering correctly then first trimester is best for gestational gest uh, estimation of gestational is that's a true statement right and date of embryo transfer is needed for calculation in IVF pregnancies that is also a true statement very good so this is the false statement so this is the wrong statement so you all know how LMP is used to calculate estimated uh, date of delivery so have a look at this here concept is here so when you have uh, the gestational age when we are counting from the first day of LMP then 40 weeks is somewhere around 280 days okay that is the gestational age but when we talk about embryonic age embryonic age is calculated from the date of fertilization isn't it so that is where ovulation took place and uh, ovulation is technically the day that fertilization also took place isn't it so when you count the embryonic age it is going to be 38 weeks that is going to be 266 days right so two weeks are less here so when we talk about embryonic development it takes about full 266 days right so that is why when we have to calculate uh, you know estimated date of delivery or edd or period of gestation then we have to rely on the date of embryo transfer okay so let's say that there is a fresh embryo transfer being done there is a fresh ivf cycle where you know oocytes were retrieved so the day the oocytes were retrieved that is the same day that fertilization in lab is also going to take place so in fresh embryo transfer cycles you can add 266 days to the egg retrieval date to arrive at the calculation of edd okay and when we are using embryo transfers like when we are going for frozen embryo transfers and we know when we are using three day uh, embryo or five day embryo then accordingly the dates have to be days have to be adjusted so when we are using a three day frozen embryo transfer then the date of embryo transfer plus 263 days are added right so three day worth of uh, growth of the embryo occurred in the lab right and when we are using a five day embryo 
फाइव डे फ्रोजन एम्ब्रो ट्रांसफर वी आर डूइंग देन डेट ऑफ एम्ब्रो ट्रांसफर प्लस टू सिक्सटी वन डेज बिकॉज फाइव डेज वर्थ ऑफ ग्रोथ ऑफ एम्ब्रो हैपन्ड इन द लैब इट सेल्फ ओके सो दैट्स दी आंसर इन दिस क्वेश्चन दैट इज हाउ वी कैलकुलेट द ई डी डी अकॉर्डिंग टू दी एम्ब्रियो ट्रांसफर क्लियर एनी डाउट्स यूर सो फार शेल वी मूव टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन Yes, Shinchan, you are readable. Let's move on to the next question now. All right, which of the following statements regarding variable decelerations is false? They are abrupt and erratic. Decrease in FHR is more than fifteen beats per minute from the baseline, lasting for at least fifteen seconds. but less than 2 minute in duration it can be followed by an acceleration and it is not seen with uterine contractions which of the following statements regarding variable decelerations is false yes what's the answer friends yes i'm waiting for your responses what's the answer d surgeon d not seen with uterine contractions somebody is saying b decrease in fhr but the decrease in fhr is going to be there na with variable decelerations also so that is also a true statement so you have doubts between most of your answering b and d ha so nobody is saying a or c fine so we have they are abrupt and erratic that's true they are abrupt and erratic that's a true statement because they can come any time with respect to contractions they can come with contraction they can come uh, before contraction they can come after contraction they can come any time right so they can be seen with uterine contractions also right they are not particularly related to you know the onset of contraction or that so not seen with uterine contractions that is the false statement okay decrease in fhr is more than 15 beats per minute lasting for at least 15 seconds that is the due, that is the definition for any deceleration that any decrease in fetal heart rate that is more than 15 beats per minute lasting for at least 15 seconds and less than 2 minutes in duration that is a deceleration period okay so that is a true statement it can be followed by an acceleration that is also a true statement and not seen with uterine contractions that's a false statement so to to sustain my answer to support my answer tell me why variable decelerations occur in the first place what is the cause variable decelerations happen because of what yes variable decelerations are seen because of what what is the reason behind these variable decelerations yes what is the reason behind these variable decelerations anybody the reason behind these variable decelerations is cord compression okay cord compression all right shantanu fetal hypoxia so obviously repeated episodes of cord compression will eventually lead to fetal hypoxia and once fetal hypoxia starts setting in na shantanu once fetal hypoxia starts setting in then at that point in time late decelerations will start coming there will be decrease in variability also right so variable decelerations by themselves particularly happen because of cord compression and that's why they are more likely seen in situations which have you know oligo hydroamnios in situations where there is uh, you know post term labor in situations where there is let's say a mal presentation which makes the possibility of cord compression more likely right and with uterine contractions also during the course of labor cord compression can occur so they can be seen with uterine contractions as well right so that is why in this question 
not seen with uterine contractions is a false statement however yes that is uh, the true statement would have been that they are not related per se to contractions they can come before after with the contractions or anything like i'll tell you an example here have a look at this example here this is a called as variable deceleration with shoulders okay so variable deceleration is very rapid it will quickly come down the fetal heart rate will quickly come down let's say if this were a contraction then it will quickly come down okay so quickly coming down meaning that that the time taken uh, for the fetal heart rate to reach its lowest point okay that time taken would be less than 30 seconds that is what abrupt means okay abrupt means that the time taken for the fetal heart rate to reach the lowest point will be less than 30 seconds and they can come be come anywhere along with the contractions as well but this is very typical of variable decelerations that is shoulders that is acceleration before and acceleration after the deceleration so this is a deceleration okay we will not call this an early deceleration this is a variable deceleration because it has these accelerations before and after the contraction this is called as variable decelerations with shoulders so this is also an extra edge to remember okay now let's also quickly revise the other types of decelerations so we have late decelerations okay in previous year mcq they had asked a detailed question on late decelerations okay so that is why today in detail we discuss variable decelerations first so late decelerations are delayed right so if this is the baseline fetal heart rate and this is the contraction you'll realize what is happening here that the fetal heart rate is dropping down right and the, there is a delay you can see here right this is the contraction this is where the contraction started and there is a delay there is a delay in which the fetal heart rate is normal the contraction has already started but the fetal heart rate has not dropped yet okay then it starts dropping and the time taken for the fetal heart rate to reach the lowest point that is the nadir this time taken is more than 30 seconds right that's why you know with late decelerations they are not abrupt they are gradual okay they are gradual right so we see here that the contraction is over and the the contraction is over and the fetal heart rate is still low and the recovery of the fetal heart rate is also delayed so these are typical these are late decelerations and rightly said by viral in fact that placental insufficiency is the cause so fetal hypoxia utero-placental insufficiency these are the causes of variable decelerations right and also any situation which will create utero placental insufficiency like for example there is a woman who is laboring right and she's getting excessive uterine contractions there's tachycystole right so tachycystole means excessive uterine contractions more than five in ten minutes excessive contractions will also cause utero placental insufficiency maternal hypotension if there is sudden maternal hypotension then how will the mother maintain forward blood flow into the placenta so maternal hypotension also creates utero placental insufficiency epidural analgesia also causes hypotension as a side effect so epidural analgesia can also contribute to utero placental insufficiency so these are the situations where late decelerations are seen all right now very very important point to note what is a prolonged deceleration let's say if there is a fetal heart rate pattern going on during labor and the fetal heart rate starts dropping 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 and it takes a long time to pick up this is a prolonged deceleration right that means that there is a fall at least 15 minutes beats per minute from the baseline it lasts for longer than two minutes but it is still less than 30 minutes so the duration of the deceleration if it's more than two minutes but less than 10 minutes it's called prolonged deceleration okay if the deceleration is so much so that it is you know beyond 10 minutes if the deceleration is not recovering at all it has gone beyond 10 minutes and the fetal heart rate is not picking up only then that's a baseline change that means baseline has also only changed that is bradycardia now keep that in mind okay so deceleration means the fetal heart rate would drop and then also return to baseline all right so remember these important pointers regarding late decelerations and let's now also cover 
early deceleration early decelerations are seen with fetal head compression okay so when fetus's head gets compressed there is this vagal stimulation right and because of vagal stimulation there is decrease in the fetal heart rate okay and when the head compression is relieved that is when the vagal stimulation is over and the heart rate heart rate returns to the baseline as simple as that that is why it is going to come with contractions it is going to coincide with contraction so in this situation the deceleration is going to be exactly a mirror image of your contraction all right keep that in mind so this is early deceleration it happens with fetal head compression all right now let's have a look at the next question a primary gravida was admitted to labor room in active labor admission ctg was normal she is getting good uterine contractions when she complains of leaking of fluid her ctg trace shows sinusoidal baseline and fresh vaginal bleeding okay so she had leaking of fluid at that point in time the ctg trace started showing sinusoidal baseline and fresh vaginal bleeding is also noted so obviously an emergency cesarean section was done but the fetus could not be saved the placenta during the time of cesarean section is found to be fundal in location and there are no retro placental clots what's the most likely diagnosis now this question requires you to think about two aspects one is the fact that the woman had bleeding the second fact that you need to focus on is that of sinusoidal baseline and you have to connect the two so what's your answer now yes placenta is found to be fundal in location so obviously it's not a placenta previa okay it could be a revealed abruption it could be a revealed abruption i don't deny that but then nothing in the question is pointing towards a placental abruption here in this situation they're not mentioning anything about the uh, tone of the uterus or any finding in you know in support of placental abruption uh, there are no retro placental clots uh, okay i mean of course if it would have been a concealed abruption there would have been retro placental clots but even when there is a revealed abruption now there is some degree of clotting appreciable behind the placenta so i'm not in favor of revealed abruption then circumvallate placenta that does not typically present in this manner okay it can lead to a plus circumvallate placenta can predispose to a certain situations like increased risk of placental abruption as well but it typically doesn't present in this manner so that's why uh, sanat answer is not c this is something very typical and kishore is answering correctly armor is also answering correctly and saurav is also answering correctly that it looks like probably a case of vasa previa very good vasa previa so what is vasa previa vasa previa when you read about the abnormalities of placenta and cord there you read about vasa previa unsupported naked fetal vessels which are traveling in the fetal membranes right unsupported naked fetal member fetal vessels traveling in the fetal membranes and this could be associated with a velamentous uh, cord insertion this could be associated with a succinctured placenta but the fact of the matter is that this is the fetal heart uh, fetal head sorry let's say here and let's say this is the cervix okay and let's say these are the fetal membranes okay and i'm saying that there are naked fetal vessels that are traveling in the fetal membranes here all right so classical presentation that when the membranes rupture okay along with leaking you know what can happen is that these are fetal vessels fetal vessels that are lying in front of the presenting part that's why vasa previa vessels in front of the presenting part and these are fetal vessels now when bleeding happens this is fetal bleeding fetal bleeding here and that is why there is this you know fetus could get exsanguinated within a matter of minutes it go it leads to sudden severe fetal distress right so that is why in this question the answer is vasa previa now does it fit the entire profile fits that she complained of leaking and then 
sinusoidal baseline occurred and fresh vaginal bleeding is noted and it's not a previa it's not abruption most likely it is vasa previa so that's your answer here so to quickly summarize again sinusoidal baseline now you'll all it will further get clear to you why the sinusoidal baseline occurred sinusoidal baseline basically is a very bad ctg trace finding it's also rarely encountered. It is seen with fetal intracranial hemorrhage, severe fetal asphyxia, or even severe fetal anemia. So now you can think about any condition which will lead to sudden development of severe fetal anemia. Okay, so bleeding vasa previa, right? Or severe fetal maternal hemorrhage like that can be seen in an RH affected fetus. Okay, and even in twin to twin transfusion syndrome in the setting of that also it can be seen where one twin is bleeding into the other twin. So it is in these settings that sinusoidal baseline is encountered. So when you, rem when you remember that severe fetal anemia can lead to sinusoidal baseline, then you also can remember what are the potential situations where this sudden severe fetal anemia will take place isn't it okay so that's your answer here now quickly revising quickly revising for your NICT clinical interpretation of CTG tracing during labor okay so when you have a category one trace and we're talking about intrapartum uh, clinical interpretation so during the course of labor while we are using ctg monitoring okay so category one trace is something which is absolutely normal normal baseline 110 to 160 normal beat to beat variability 5 to 25 beats per minute accelerations if present is very good accelerations by themselves absent doesn't necessarily mean bad finding okay and there should be no decelerations so if this is the situation it's called as a category one trace then it is absolutely normal okay then let's remember what is absolutely abnormal absolutely abnormal is category three trace that means there is absent variability along with any of the other things meaning absent variability plus bradycardia absent variability plus persistent late decelerations absent variability plus persistent variable decelerations so this or there is a sinusoidal baseline these are category three trace they are absolutely absolutely abnormal okay so whenever you have a situation whenever you have a situation where you are going to have a category three trace okay then what are we going to do because this is absolutely abnormal we have to expedite delivery okay that is why it is important to remember all the rest of the permutation combinations now they are in category 2 which is a very broad category so you don't need to remember that but at least know what is absolutely normal and what is absolutely abnormal right so whenever we have a category 2 trace or let's say if we have a category 3 trace then in those situations we have to put certain resuscitative measures in place certain resuscitative measures in place okay so just now we discussed all the different kind of uh, decelerations and what leads to those decelerations isn't it so now what are the resuscitative measures that we are going to put in place we know that cord compression can cause fetal heart rate deceleration right so let us put the woman in a position where the cord compression could be relieved right so let's say left lateral position left lateral position also improves utero-placental perfusion right so that's why left lateral position we shift the patient to left lateral position we start the patient on iv fluids right we have to maintain the hydration maintain the hydration we have to correct the hypotension because i told you that maternal hypotension can also lead to late deceleration so correct the hypotension then stop the oxytocin if there is any oxytocin that is ongoing because i told you that uterine tachycystole can be causing uh, you know late decelerations so these are the resuscitative measures we put in place along with that oxygen by mask improve the oxygenation of the mother 
therefore improve the oxygenation of the fetus right and we also perform a per vaginal examination we also perform a per vaginal examination okay and what is the importance of doing a per vaginal examination here see doing a per vaginal examination will tell me uh, whether she is just about to deliver or not you know what which stage of labor is she in secondly it will also help me rule out it will also help me rule out any cord prolapse maybe that is the reason for her sudden fetal distress it will help me rule out placental abruption also right so these are the resuscitative measures we put in place keep then in mind this can be a clinical question all right and also please remember that if the category 3 trace is there then along with the resuscitative measures we also have to expedite delivery we also have to expedite delivery okay by expediting delivery meaning we can do a cesarean section or we can do an instrumental vaginal delivery if the criteria for instrumental vaginal delivery is met instrumental vaginal delivery otherwise a cesarean section immediately will be required okay fine now let's come to the next question all right so an unbooked multiparous woman reports to the emergency with an episode of painless vaginal bleeding she also reports not being able to perceive fetal movements for past 4 weeks okay now per abdomen shows that the uterus is relaxed okay and the symphysofundal height is 32 cm fetal heart rate is not heard by stethoscope urgent ultrasound shows absent cardiac activity with spalding sign and a central placenta previa which of the following is most valuable at this point in time Yes I'm waiting for your responses guys I'm Yes so armor you are right this is a case of intrauterine death all right and yes intrauterine death case which is very correct so now you have to think about two aspects yaar there is intrauterine death spalding sign has come meaning that it must have been at least at least a week has gone by because spalding sign uh, which is referred to as the overriding of skull bones that happens when the brain tissue gets macerated na so there is this spalding sign that has come meaning at least at least one week has gone by moreover she is not perceiving fetal movements for past four weeks right so that also means it has it is a long standing intrauterine death case all right so one thing is there but it is also showing central placenta previa all right so what is the most valuable at this time yes anybody you have to think about two aspects you have to think about two aspect one it is a case of iud second there is a central placenta previa okay yes what is the most valuable thing to do right now one thing that you want to do immediately of course you know you are going to uh of course you're going to deliver her i don't deny that right of course you're going to deliver her but saurav you're saying option number d okay and sarjan is saying option number a some of bharti is saying option number d so i agree with bharti and dogot there 
do god or do god or whatever it is i'm sorry if i'm not pronouncing correctly so you're right that a cesarean will be required for delivery i agree on that since it's a central placenta previa case emergency cesarean section needs to be done but before i do that before i do that i need a baseline investigation i at least need a baseline coagulation profile right iud is also associated with uh, dic remember iud increases risk of dic particularly when a dead fetus has been retained for a long duration of time agreed on that right so usually dic will not happen immediately after an iud it's more likely when we you know four weeks have gone by and the dead fetus has been you know retained for at least four weeks so now in this situation i will have to first go for a baseline cbc a baseline coagulation profile hai na aise thodi i can just do an emergency cesarean section what if she is severely anemic also i need to keep blood arranged also this is certain center center placenta previa case i'll do a cesarean section she bleed too much she may need blood transfusion during surgery i need a cbc i need a coagulation profile i need to send for the routine investigations blood for cross matching and all that all that is required so at this point in time most valuable becomes cbc and coagulation profile there is no waiting and watching for spontaneous onset of labor in this situation central placenta previa is um, anyways a contraindication for vaginal delivery keep that in mind also that's an important pointer okay now did anybody say amniocentesis by fetal karyotype did anybody pick pick that choice amniocentesis by fetal karyotype no nobody picked that choice amniocentesis by fetal karyotype so why the fetus died that is also an important question na right so if i have to do a fetal karyotype now amniocentesis is not going to be much of a help in this particular situation because here it is going to be dead macerated baby all right and in this situation it is very difficult to achieve any tissue from amniocentesis so amniocentesis is generally not preferred of course after the delivery after the delivery i will go for you know any assessment of the uh, fetus so please keep that in mind also that after delivery in iud cases you know you have to go for a fetal survey you know we have to check if there are any gross anatomical uh, defects that can be visible i will advise uh, for an autopsy also right i will send for a placental histopath right so sometimes you know of course autopsy is a thing that you know needs consent from the parents and autopsy may not be acceptable to uh, all patients so again you have to take it with consent okay and we have to do chromosomal analysis of the fetus also chromosomal analysis of the fetus as well so that can be done after delivery in iud cases okay keep that in mind all right now let's have a look at the next question a primary is admitted in lr at term in active labor on clinical examination the fetus seems average sized uterus is term sized with a slight supra pubic flattening and fsh is best heard at the right flank she is getting mild contractions fetal heart rate is 130 beats per minute on pv examination she is 4 cm dilated partially faced with a loose hanging bag of membranes vertex is at minus 2 station sagittal suture is felt obliquely and anterior fontanelle is felt more easily towards the left pubic rami the pelvis is average gynecoid how is she managed allow her to progress in spontaneum spontaneous labor do an arm oxytocin augmentation 
or perform an emergency cesarean section now this question tests first of all your ability to identify the position of the fetus first that second this question tests whether you know how to monitor for labor progress okay so these are the two aspects that you have to think of while attempting this question so first of all attempting the question which position are we talking about the woman is in active labor they have given all the necessary information okay your most important clues are fsh best heard at the right flank okay they are saying that she is 4 cm dilated partially faced all that is fine loose hanging bag of membranes that is also fine these findings are just now encountered at 4 cm dilatation sagittal suture felt obliquely anterior fontanelle towards the left pubic rami so pelvis is average gynecoid how is she managed what is the presentation what is the presentation what is the position she is laboring in which position occipito anterior position or occipito posterior position yes and even if you don't know the position let's assume you don't you don't know the position only at least we know it is vertex presentation it is vertex presentation at least we know that in vertex it will either be occipito anterior either be occipito posterior okay fine in this particular situation it is right occipito posterior okay fsh heard best at the woman's right flank there is mild supra pubic flattening and if you look at this sagittal suture is obliquely placed with anterior fontanelle anterior fontanelle towards the pubic rami so this is rop position that she is laboring in चलो दिस मच डन ओके नाउ वट यू थिंक वट शुड डू वट इज द मोस्ट लाइकली आउटकम वट इज द मोस्ट लाइकली आउटकम वेन वुमेन लेबर इन आर ओ पी प्रेजेंटेशन मोस्ट लाइकली आउटकम यस एंड नाउ डॉक्टर साहब इज आंसर डॉक्टर साहब इज द फर्स्ट पर्सन नो अर्लियर ऑल्सो पीपल आंसर यस सर्जन एंड योगी ऑल्सो आंसर ए यस so allow her to progress in spontaneous labor what is the problem with progress anterior rotation will take place that happens most of the times pelvis is also average gynecoid why not with good uterine contractions head flexion will be maintained and it will become occipito anterior of course the progress during labor could slightly be delayed i agree on that but what is the need to do anything else allow her to progress in spontaneous labor right now she is only 4 cm you give her some time why to do an unnecessary arm it is not indicated at this point in time if the labor progress is slow let's say for example we allowed her to progress let's say 4 hours down the line or 6 hours down the line there is no progress happening at all then we may think of giving oxytocin augmentation to increase the contractions and everything and definitely not an emergency cesarean section right now right so in this clinical question they are no way mentioning that the progress is slow or the progress is arrested okay so allow her to progress in spontaneous labor okay that's the correct answer for this question all right so cesarean sections they are done when arrest of labor happens okay and what is the definition for arrest of labor at least 4 hours of good uterine contractions na at least 4 hours of good uterine contractions and she you know has crossed the 6 cm dilatation threshold then i will call it as uh, you know um, arrest of labor so cesarean section is done for arrest of dilatation arrest of dilatation meaning that at least she is 6 cm dilated and then she stuck at that point in time at least 4 hours of good contractions membranes are absent and yet there is no change in cervical dilatation 
then i will call it as arrest of dilatation and then i will do a cesarean section not right now okay right now she is not qualifying for the criteria of arrest of labor right now clear any doubts in this question let's see the next question this is a previous year question previous year mcq from ini ct which of the following statements is true regarding breech presentation which of the following statements is true regarding breech presentation you have to identify the true statement okay induction of labor is contraindicated breech vaginal delivery cannot be done in primary gravida ecv that is external cephalic version cannot be done if pelvis is inadequate primary gravida with breech is always delivered by cesarean section yes what's your answer dr saab first first to answer option number c right anybody else disagreeing kishore also c sanat also c anybody of any other opinion anybody of any difference of opinion here no very good doctor travanti d primary with breech is always delivered by cesarean section that's 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 not true okay so let us just let us just clarify one thing to begin with okay there is a woman let's say she is in breech presentation she has three options okay one is a breech vaginal delivery second is uh, we offer an external cephalic version and third is a direct cesarean section okay so please remember that external cephalic version is offered to all women with breech presentation who fulfill the criteria who fulfill the criteria okay for them external cephalic version is offered to all women whether primary whether multi whatever okay then there will be certain situations where we will deliver always by cesarean section so the direct or the absolute indications for a cesarean section in breech are two are two one is a footling breech and the second is a breech with hyper extended head breech with hyper extended head which we call as the stargazer breech okay i'm talking about hyper extended head not extended legs not frank breech or anything okay breech with hyper extended head these are the absolute indications for cesarean section in breech right now breech vaginal delivery is also an option both for primary gravidas both for multi gravidas as well but then again such decisions have to be taken keep you know after discussing with the woman like for example if a woman says that i am not willing for a external cephalic version i i uh, you know i want a cesarean section instead i don't want a breech vaginal delivery instead so then in that circumstances cesarean section can be done all right so there are certain situations where cesarean section is not absolutely indicated however it is going to be preferred okay keep that in mind so we're going to talk about those situations one by one so let's first of all answer the question induction of labor is contraindicated that is not a true statement okay induction of labor can also be done augmentation of labor can also be done when there is a breech presentation it's not preferred okay in clinical practice we don't prefer it that much but induction of labor is not contraindicated so this is a false statement okay breech vaginal delivery can be done in primary gravida also it can be done in multi para also and yes many prefer to do cesarean section for primary gravida with breech but it's not like it's always required a primary gravida with breech if she's 
fulfilling the criteria for external cephalic version that will be offered to her so breech vaginal delivery cannot be done in primary gravida that is also a false statement ecv cannot be done if pelvis is inadequate see when we do external cephalic version we make the breech back to cephalic okay so pelvis should be adequate now because why are we doing external cephalic version so that vaginal delivery can happen all right because we have made it cephalic now for cephalic vaginal delivery will happen but if pelvis is inadequate then how can we do external cephalic version why will we do so external cephalic version cannot be done if pelvis is inadequate that is a true statement and second statement primary with breech is always delivered by cesarean section that is also an incorrect statement it's not always that she should definite that you tell a woman private primary breech that there is absolutely no option for you just a cesarean section no that's that's not true so this is also a false statement so the only true statement here is option number c all right get it right all of you any doubts all right so when we have a woman with breech presentation okay first of all we are going to see is it footling breach is it breach with hyper extended head then i would like to go for a cesarean section directly okay then i would like to see if the prerequisites for ecv are fulfilled because then i will offer her the option of ecv or external cephalic version as well so what are the criteria what are the prerequisites she should be at least more than 36 weeks single turn pregnancy right pelvis should be adequate placenta should not be in the upper segment right it should be not low lying sorry placenta should not be in the lower segment it should not be a placenta previa placenta should be not low lying placenta should be in the upper segment liker should be adequate membrane should be present healthy baby and healthy mother basically uncomplicated cases okay no gca no gross congenital anomaly in the baby and the baby is healthy and there should be no preeclampsia or hypertension if you remember these prerequisites you remember the absolute contraindications absolute contraindications to external cephalic version that's another important mcq pointer so if you happen to find a woman who is less than 36 weeks we will not go for external cephalic version isn't it so prematurity is a contraindication multiple pregnancy if there are two fetuses how are we going to move them inside how are we going to do version if there is any contraindication to vaginal delivery like if the pelvis is inadequate then vaginal delivery only cannot be done right if the placenta previa is there then placenta previa by itself is an indication for cesarean section why will do i why will i do an external cephalic version right if the oligohydroamniosis is there okay then moving the baby inside becomes technically difficult first is that and also understand you know that we are you know doing external cephalic version we are moving the baby and making it cephalic now in that process what could happen in that process what could happen in that process complications can happen like cord compression you know or cord entanglement or when we are moving the baby inside can even trigger placental abruption also the process will increase the risk of uh, increased risk of fetal maternal hemorrhage is also there then this is particularly more applicable to rh negative women particularly more applicable to rh negative women right so these complications are anticipated that will happen with the procedure or that can happen with the procedure so now understand here that oligohydroamnios by itself also increases the risk of cord compression so why will i like to do the procedure if there is a oligohydroamnios right suppose there is a baby already with fetal compromise already with utero placental insufficiency severe iugr fetus you know deranged doppler why will i subject that fetus to this risk of external cephalic version so again when there is a non reassuring fetal heart rate non reassuring fetal heart rate is an absolute contraindication preeclampsia is an absolute contraindication hypertension is an absolute contraindication because in these situations the risk of placental abruption is anyways higher 
right so these are absolute contraindications to external cephalic version remember that and sometimes there can be let's say for example a structural uteral abnormality like septate uterus or bicornuate uterus then technically the procedure cannot be done because the uterine cavity is distorted so when there is a structural uterine abnormality then also this procedure cannot be done and there are certain situations where cesarean is preferred right so uh, there are certain situations where cesarean is preferred but these are not absolute indications of doing a cesarean section in breech presentation okay so many in your exams they ask you questions like this you know which among them is an absolute contraindication or a relative contraindication so they will trick you into choosing options like this right so that's why i tell you the most important list to remember is the prerequisites for ecv right and the absolute contraindications to ecv all right otherwise in complicated cases cesarean section is is preferred like patient request big baby macrosomia previous cesarean section so previous cesarean section with breech external cephalic version is not absolutely contraindicated but direct cesarean section is generally more preferred or then when there is an apparently healthy viable preterm fetus in active labor or an indicated delivery is being performed for a preterm fetus then also i would like to go for a cesarean section preferably severe fetal growth restriction or there is a fetal anomaly that is incompatible with vaginal delivery right there is a big hydrocephalus okay that means that uh, the, even the head will not come out then what is the point of going for an external cephalic version right and if there is a prior perinatal death or prior, poor obstetric history so then in those situations cesarean is generally preferred but these are not absolute indications for cesarean section keep that in mind okay so you don't need to mug this particular list up but the list that you need to mug up is this the direct absolute indications for cesarean section what are the prerequisites once you remember the prerequisites you remember what are the absolute contraindications to ecv keep that in mind okay so any doubts here or shall we move to the next question yes let's see the next question an 8 month pregnant woman is admitted to the er in an unconscious state her bp is 60 by 40 heart rate is 120 respiratory rate is 34 per minute hemodynamic instability is there she is in shock you clear with this there has been no vaginal bleeding which of the following diagnosis can be excluded straight forward question very straight forward question she is having shock but there has been no vaginal bleeding which of the following differential diagnosis can be excluded good evening zen mode we are doing this question yes anybody answering can be excluded matlab ye to hai hi nahi this is not the diagnosis at all this is an unconscious patient with hemodynamic instability in shock but there is no vaginal bleeding there has been no vaginal bleeding which diagnosis can be excluded yes think 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 amar surgeon bhavnesh sagar sanat think 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 think, think. think 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 okay you are saying eclampsia majority of you are saying eclampsia can stroke happen in eclampsia can stroke occur in eclampsia intracerebral hemorrhage can a eclampsia patient have intra cerebral hemorrhage can she have stroke i'm giving you an example giving you an example can an eclampsia patient have stroke can an eclampsia patient have hepatic rupture can an eclampsia patient have placental abruption also at the same time 
So an eclampsia patients can also collapse or go in shock without any vaginal bleeding evident outside. So your eclampsia, I can't exclude it. Differential, I, I have to consider eclampsia as a possibility. Of course, they have not given any other information here. They have not mentioned high BP and that got you confused. Okay, maybe this woman is seen for the first time at 8 month pregnant woman, unbooked patient. Who knows what her BP was earlier? Right? Who knows what her BP was earlier? Maybe now she is having some other complication. Some stroke, maybe some hepatic rupture, some intraperitoneal bleeding. Maybe she has placental abruption. So placental abruption cases can also have, uh, you know, concealed abruption. Ne? Concealed abruption when the visible bleeding isn't much at all. Or maybe not be there at all. Just a altered colored, altered, altered brown colored discharge may be there. So I need to keep the possibility of placental abruption in mind. I need to keep the possibility of eclampsia in mind. I can't exclude it. Amniotic fluid embolism. That can also occur. That can also occur and can lead to hemodynamic instability. It immediately leads to uh, heart failure. So that can also be there. But what about Achha, Bhavnesh, amniotic fluid embolism. Bache, amniotic fluid embolism may be to sakta hai. Like amniotic fluid embolism is just embolism. Pulm it's, a, it's a type of pulmonary embolism. Okay, it's a type of pulmonary embolism right because of amniotic fluid leaking into the maternal systemic circulation and amniotic fluid and you know uh, tissue uh, fetal tissues and fetal squames they are getting entrapped in the lung circulation now so it's basically pulmonary embolism right and then tachycardia low bp all that will happen now respiratory discomfort respiratory rate will also breathlessness will also develop so the amniotic fluid embolism i can't rule out but placenta previa, now you're thinking, yes, Sagar Sajan Kishore Kumar, yes, placenta previa, however, if a woman has placenta previa, then she will first bleed. That is the only thing. She will bleed and then she will go into hemorrhagic shock. So if there is no bleeding, the differential diagnosis that I can exclude from among the four options is placenta previa. Because I can't think of any other circumstance where a placenta previa can lead to shock without any bleeding. I mean, it has, the patient has to bleed and then only she will develop hemorrhagic shock, right? So this diagnosis I can exclude provided there has been no vaginal bleeding, right? So that's the answer here, right? So I like such kind of questions that they're nice to interact with these such kind of, they make you think a lot. They make you think about different possibilities. And this is, this is what happens in medicine also. A patient comes with a particular scenario and then we have to rule out, to keep in mind the different possibilities that can happen. Straightforward question, previous year MCQ, previous year question, arrange in correct sequence for active management of third stage of labor. Check for another fetus, control cord traction, uterotonics, uterine massage. What is the correct sequence? Yes. What is the correct sequence? Yes. What is the correct sequence? Yes, waiting for your responses. What is the correct sequence? Eutrotonics have to be given after the... What do you know? What do you know about uh, active management of third stage of labor? Eutrotonics, most important step. Eutrotonics have to be given immediately after delivery of the baby. That is also correct. But if it is a twin pregnancy, if there is another twin yet to deliver, then you will not start with active management of third stage of labor. Now there is another fetus left to deliver. Isn't it? So common sense, logic, check for another fetus. Check for another fetus. Give the uterotonics. And when we give the uterotonics after the delivery of the baby, preferably we have to give in within, preferably we have to give within 10 minutes. We have to give, sorry, within one minute. Not sorry, not 10, one. 
within one minute we have to give the utero tonic and it is after the delivery of the baby nothing doing after about the anterior shoulder or anything nothing like that okay after the delivery of the baby within one minute utero tonics have to be given then we don't have to wait for signs of placental separation okay we can start with controlled cord traction okay with the uterine contraction so control cord traction has to be done with uterine contractions and after that we deliver the placenta and after that intermittent uterine tone assessment is what the who recommends but a uterine massage is given in the option so that's also fine so the correct sequence is 1 3 2 right so that's your correct answer majority of you answered correctly so remember the amtsl recommendations utrotonics after delivery of the baby but i've given you the logic that obviously if there's a second and one the, on the way you won't start delayed cord clamping okay that means not before one minute delayed cord clamping means not before one minute okay controlled cord traction is done and intermittent uterine tone assessment is also done now the only situations where early cord clamping is recommended these are the three most valid indications for early cord clamping keep them in mind okay the most accepted indications are it's if the newborn is asphyxiated then you need to cord, clamp the cord quickly and hand over the baby to the pediatrician for immediate resuscitation if there is a known heart disease of the baby then you don't want to give extra blood to the baby right the, the baby's heart will not be able to handle so you don't want to infuse extra blood volume into the baby so if there's a known heart disease in the baby or let's say that you know uh, the baby has delivered but the placenta is still inside it's she's in third stage of labor but there's so much bleeding happening so much so that you feel that the only way the bleeding will stop is actually when the placenta will be delivered and the, when the uterus is going to contract that's how the bleeding stops right after delivery so if there's excessive maternal bleeding in the third stage these are the three valid indications of going ahead with early cord clamping so keep them in mind as well okay so keep them in mind that when you have a preterm fetus or when you have let's say an rh negative pregnancy okay then delayed cord clamping is done there is no contraindication to delayed cord clamping right and then there is this whole discrepancy about uh, hiv positive mother okay all right kishore rh incompatibility see if it's an rh affected fetus okay if it's an rh affected hydropic fetus then i might not like to overload the heart but simply rh negative there's so many rh negative women now not all of those women have rh positive fetuses not all of those rh positive fetus actually have hemolytic disease right so rh negative pregnancy delayed cord clamping all right and preterm fetus delayed cord clamping right and other than that hiv hiv positive woman okay so in an hiv positive pregnant woman who is saying delayed cord clamping okay and the government of india that is the naco guidelines are saying early cord clamping naco guidelines are saying early cord clamping so there is this discrepancy but to answer in exams you'll have to see what other options are provided along with it okay then also remember the utrotonics they're asking you a lot of stuff about utrotonics so keep them in mind oxytocin methargin mesoprostol i've summarized here for you people you can look back when you see the notes the important pointers from this chart is that when they ask you drug of choice for active management of third stage of labor it is oxytocin okay that is the drug of choice here for active management of third stage of labor and what we are doing is 10 units intramuscular it is never given iv bolus right so this is i think you already know these points you people have given uh, neat exam recently right so you already know these points that oxytocin is never given iv bolus if it is given iv bolus it is going to cause sudden hypotension tachycardia and can even lead to myocardial arrest so not at all iv bolus okay then uh, methargin can be given mesoprostol can also be used remember carbitocin carbitocin is an octapeptide it is a synthetic analog of oxytocin it is the long acting drug it is longer acting than oxytocin and carbitocin can be used for active management of third stage of labor but it is not recommended for pph 
it is not recommended for pph and sintometrin is a fixed dose uh, fixed dose combination of sinto for oxytocin metrin for methergin so it's a fixed dose combination of oxytocin and methergin that is can be used in amtsl but it is not recommended for pph so that is also another important pointer you will remember and carboprost that is the pgf2 alpha analog that comes with the name hemabate that is not recommended for active management of third stage of labor where is it recommended pph management it is definitely recommended right and always keep in mind the important uh, you know contraindications the only two place where you have to remember contraindications are for methergin and you have to remember contraindications for uh, you know carboprost and for carboprost bronchial asthma is a contraindication and for methergin hypertension preeclampsia eclampsia heart disease peripheral vascular diseases you know rh negative uh, pregnancy okay i have not included included it in the list of uh, absolute contraindications so rh negative is last in my list of contraindications there right so keep them in mind because the question can be asked which drug is used which drug is not used so these are eutrotonics drugs but then some drugs are recommended for amtsl some are recommended for pp h remember carbitocin centrometrine not recommended for pph carboprost not recommended for active management of third stage of labor pge2 analogs like dinoprostone they are used in induction of labor as cervical ripening agents okay they are not recommended for active management of third stage of labor they are not even recommended for pph cases please remember that okay now let's come to the next question all right see <clears throat> a 23 year old primary at 39 weeks of gestation presented with prom okay her pulse rate is 94 bp is 100 by 60 so far so far fine pv exam shows cervix is 2 cm 80 percent efface vertex plus 1 ctg normal everything fine okay she is admitted you were ordered to start the infusion you were ordered to start the oxytocin infusion oxytocin infusion at 1 miu per minute and keep increasing by 1 miu per minute every 15 minutes however mistakes happen however the infusion was started at 10 miu per minute increased by 10 miu per minute by the time the error was discovered she was receiving 50 miu per minute which of the following complications is the patient at most risk for what is the most immediate complication once you realize your mistake of course you're going to first of all immediately stop the oxytocin infusion have a look at the woman's status of uterine contractions have a look at the ctg chart we've discussed the ctg at length you know so many decelerations can happen because of um, uh because of uh, excessive contractions so which of the following complications is most likely at this point in time surgeon very correctly saying yeah you you giving too much of oxytocin here okay you giving too much of oxytocin here so obviously the complication that you expect is tachycystole right and oxytocin is a drug which which the response is titrated or the dose is titrated the infusion rate is titrated according to the contractions right so the moment the infusion is stopped you know the effect of oxytocin will also go away right so tachycystole is the most likely complication or it is the it is the complication that the patient is at most risk for okay rupture uterus first tachycystole will happen and then rupture uterus is generally more often is seen if there is a grand multi para or let's say there is a history of previous cesarean section then the rupture uterus chances becomes more likely in primary gravidas typically excessive uterine contractions do not usually cause rupture because the uterus tends to get exhausted rather than rupturing in primary gravidas right now hypote hypertension is not a side effect of oxytocin hypotension is a side effect and i told you iv bolus okay hypotension sudden hypotension can happen with iv bolus and what about hypernatremia what about hypernatremia hyponatremia can be a complication not hype 
per natremia so when will hyponatremia happen not usual sometimes seen with very high dosages of oxytocin very high dosages of oxytocin very high dosages of oxytocin over prolonged duration of time over prolonged duration of time and we have given iv fluids also na iv fluids also we have given right because we are giving by iv infusion then in those situation what can happen water intoxication water intoxication okay basically this is fluid retention basically this is fluid retention because of adh like action anti diuretic hormone like action of oxytocin that is seen in high dosages very high dosages over prolonged duration of time then in that situation you know there can be uh, pulmonary edema there can be uh, electrolyte imbalances like hyponatremia it can also lead to convulsions as well so it can be a dangerous complication but it's not very common keep that in mind right so let's move on to the next question now what is the true statement regarding genetic screening tests during pregnancy this is a previous year inicet question it's mostly invasive they are diagnostic gene mapping is done they help estimating the risk of a genetic defect you have to identify the true statement yes what is the true statement yes what is the true statement thank you arbor and what is the true statement regarding genetic screening tests they are talking about aneuploidy screening tests right zenmod hypotension occurs as a side effect of oxytocin action on the smooth muscles of the vascular system vascular endothelium relaxation but that only happens with iv bolus only happens with iv bolus okay all right so surgeon and doctor saab answering they help in estimating the risk of a genetic defect yes very good so this is the only true statement they are not invasive they are screening tests they are blood tests right they are not diagnostic because they have to be confirmed with an invasive fetal testing and gene mapping everything all that karyotyping everything that is done on invasive fetal testing they are not part of the screening test so this was a straight forward question now what are the extra pointers that you need to remember about these screening tests right so you remember that first trimester combined screening done between 11 weeks to 13 weeks 6 days okay so this is a quick recall you've read about all of this for neat pg preparation as well it includes serum beta hcg serum pape and on transfer channel sonography we check for the nuchal translucency then triple test i have not written because triple test we are not doing any more but in case they ask you triple test is hcg maternal serum alpha preto protein and unconjugated yeast trial when we do only three markers it is called as triple test but it has become almost obsolete quadruple test is available everywhere to be done between 15 to 20 weeks and it includes inhibin as well and then we have the integrated a uh, test where we do a first trimester combined screening uh, in the first trimester and then a quadruple test in the second trimester and then get an integrated result okay now important mcq pointers that you are going to remember from here let's talk about trisomy 21 and trisomy 18 okay so trisomy 21 down syndrome remember hi i told you for down syndrome i told you hi so what is high hcg is high inhibin is high rest all are low so in trisomy 21 beta hcg is high pape is low okay and in trisomy 21 look here in the quad test hcg is high alpha fetoprotein low unconjugated yeast trial low inhibin high okay this is for trisomy 21 this is for trisomy 21 in trisomy 18 both are low 
in trisomy 18 both are low beta hcg and pape both are low that's an important pointer to remember and as far as the quad test goes hcg is low and all are low all are low and inhibin is not included in the calculation inhibin is not part of the calculation while calculating the risk for trisomy 18 so these are important additional extra mcq pointers all right then additional extra mcq pointers see the detection rate the detection rate of the integrated test is quite high 94 to 96 percent rest combined screening and quadruple screening they have comparable um, you know detection rates okay all right now the other important point that you need to remember here is that the positive predictive value of these tests, I'm talking about these serum tests, okay, the positive predictive value of these tests, that means if they are positive, right, what is the predictive value, what is the likelihood that yes, the fetus would definitely be affected, it is only about 3 to 5 percent, it is only about 3 to 5 percent, false positive rate overall is also about 5 percent. Okay, so they could be falsely positive also in 5% cases. So they always need to be confirmed by an invasive fetal testing, right? So these are important percentages you need to keep in mind. They're asking you a lot of questions in INICT over the past couple of years about aneuploidy screening because a lot of uh, us have started doing it as routine practice, right? So NIPT is another um, non-invasive prenatal testing it is called as non-invasive prenatal testing right cell-free fetal dna testing right now we take the maternal blood sample in the maternal blood sample there is cell-free fetal dna in circulation which uh, comes from the apoptotic or the dying placental trophoblasts right so remember the syncytial trophoblast in the placenta is in direct contact with the maternal blood in the intervillous spaces so apoptotic placental trophoblast they can uh, you know lead to um, release of cell free fetal DNA into the maternal systemic circulation and now there are techniques available by which we can extract it right so cell free fetal DNA from apoptotic placental tropoblasts are analyzed and that fetal DNA can be used for testing right it can be done anytime beyond 10 weeks we can't do it before 10 weeks before 10 weeks the fetal fraction or the uh, fraction of fetal DNA present in the maternal systemic circulation is very less we need at least 10% fetal fraction in the maternal systemic circulation. And currently it is available for trisomy 21, 18, 13 and monosomy X. Limiting factor is the cost. It is very costly. Uh, and so that is why it, uh, you know, it, that, that there's a difficulty in doing it for all women. However, it does give a detection rate of 99%. And nowadays with NIPT, we can even check for the fetal blood group. So fetal blood group with selfie fetal DNA testing is also possible. So detection rate is highest. So this is a potential MCQ here. Currently, the highest detection rate is offered by, among the screening tests, is offered by NIPT. PT, but that doesn't mean that it can't be falsely positive. NIPT can also be false positive in about 0.2% cases. That's why you need to confirm. It is still a screening test. Okay, so NIPT is also a screening test. If NIPT is positive, you still have to confirm by invasive fetal testing right so currently what is the utility of nipt currently let's say for example those women who are at increased risk of having a down syndrome affected fetus because of their age maternal age more than 35 or the ultrasound is showing certain soft markers which increase the probability of having a down syndrome affected fetus or in the you know in the first trimester combined screening only the nt is raised okay isolated raised nt meaning nuchal translucency right or there is a prior pregnancy with an autosomal trisomy let's say for example that there is a situation uh, there's a situation let's say for example a woman already has a prior affected fetus with down syndrome now in this pregnancy the, the chance of recurrence is definitely there right so in that situation, NIPT can be used, but the best thing to do here, the best thing to be do here would be an invasive fetal testing. Okay, in this situation, best would be to go for an invasive fetal testing 
to confirm if the fetus that the woman is carrying now is having down syndrome or not because that is the confirmation otherwise nipt is also just a screening test only all right now nipt cannot be used as a second screening test keep that in mind and this is something that is new because earlier it was being advocated that if there is a screening test positive now let's say for example uh, uh, first trimester combined screen positive or quadruple screen positive okay let's do nipt now okay so that should not be done it cannot cannot be used as second screening test because please remember that if there is a screen positive patient if there is a screen positive patient even if the nipt we do even if the nipt we do and it is negative can you tell the patient that there is absolutely no chance that your fetus is going to have uh, down syndrome can you can you make that declaration that you were screen positive but now i've done nipt nipt is also negative can you give 100% declaration to the woman that absolutely under no circumstances your fetus is having down syndrome because nipt is negative no even if nipt is negative there is still a residual risk of affected fetus there is still a probability that the fetus could be affected and that is 2% so don't ignore a screening test that came positive first right so all in all the best way to confirm whether a fetus is affected by down syndrome or not is by invasive fetal testing and cario typing right and then last situation either parent is a known carrier of balanced translocation balanced robertsonian translocation involving chromosome 21 or 13 because these translocations can be transmitted to the offspring and then the offspring can have unbalanced translocation and the offspring could have an extra 21 chromosome material right so in that situation also we can go for nipt that's 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 fine all right okay now also please remember you yeah, know this was an this was an aims neat pg question okay this was an aims aims at that time it was not inict but this is a old question but it's a very valid question let's say there is a let's say there is a couple with either partner couple with either partner having a translocation 2121 okay either partner is a carrier of translocation 2121 okay they also have a prior child with down syndrome please remember that if either parent is a carrier okay then there is absolutely no chance of a normal offspring there will be 100% recurrence of down syndrome 100% recurrence of down syndrome in the fetus okay keep that in mind that's an important point okay so whosoever is carrying the mute whosoever is carrying the translocation whether mother or whether the father it doesn't matter they will always form abnormal gametes and there will be absolutely no chance of normal offspring this is an extra edge pointer you need to keep in mind now let's have a look at the next question which of the following statements are correct regarding the procedure shown below so you have to first identify the procedure and then and then talk about what is the correct statement okay you have to find the correct statement it's done between 15 to 20 weeks procedure of choice to diagnose neural tube defects can detect fetal anemia also cannot be done in rh negative women yes which of the following statements are correct at least you know when you have such kind of questions at least choose one option of which you are very sure like for example here i am very sure that it is done between 15 to 20 weeks okay so this is a true statement for me okay this is a correct statement this is a true statement this is a correct statement okay so one is in option number 1 is in a or b so i answer has to be either a or answer has to be either c so this is definitely b and d are definitely not the answer so now i have to eliminate between option number a and option number c armor and surgeon you are saying it is the procedure of choice to diagnose neural tube defects 
is that a true statement neural tube defects are structural abnormalities okay there is a maybe a spina bifida maybe an nn kefeli maybe a meningo encephalocele a meningo seal on the back of the baby's spine now these are diagnosed by how are these neural tube defects diagnosed these are diagnosed by targeted sonography they are diagnosed by ultrasound amniocentesis is not a procedure of choice to diagnose neural tube defects at the most in situations i'll tell you i'll tell you i'll tell you yes they are given in textbook amniocentesis to diagnose neural tube defects you will give me options also you will say okay you only tell me what do we do for diagnosing of neural tube defects if at all amniocentesis if at all amniocentesis us pe kya check karna hai what should i check in amniocentesis what should i check in amniocentesis yes what should i check in amniocentesis armor and surgeon yes what should i check in amniocentesis if at all you say that we should we should we should do it for diagnosing neural tube defects i told you there structural defects structural abnormalities that will be visible on ultrasound but then you say ke no i want to do amniocentesis to diagnose neural tube defects what do you want to check in amniocentesis anybody can help them out yes anybody can answer what to check what to check amniotic fluid alpha fetoprotein levels more importantly amniotic fluid acetylcholine esterase levels अरे आर्मर बच्चे न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट्स आर स्ट्रक्चरल डिफेक्ट्स उसमें कैरियोटाइप का क्या मतलब है कैरियोटाइप इज नॉट एबनॉर्मल ना दीज आर स्ट्रक्चरल एबनॉर्मलिटीज राइट नॉट क्रोमोजोमल एबनॉर्मलिटीज बट यू विच यू कैन चेक बाय कैरियोटाइप ठीक है सो यस दीज विल हेल्प मी डायग्नोज ओपन न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट दीज आर इंक्रीज इन ओपन न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट्स ओके सो if at all a fetal surgery i'll tell you what is the utility if at all a fetal surgery is planned where a correction is being planned ke bhai whether it is open neural tube defect or closed neural tube defect whether a fetal surgery needs to be done or not then in those situations it is required to do an amniocentesis otherwise it is not we don't need this information generally whether it is an open neural tube defect or whether it is a closed neural tube defect much of that information can be gained by a targeted sonography uh, itself right so not in all so it's not the procedure of choice to diagnose neural tube defects however it can be used to diagnose neural tube defects that's why this is a false statement it can detect fetal anemia yes again for this purpose it is no longer currently being done for early detection of fetal anemia in rh affected pregnancies we are going for middle cerebral artery doppler which is non invasive right so it can detect fetal anemia that's true but what is also true is that we are not again using it as an investigation of choice or a procedure of choice for detection of fetal anemia it can be done in rh negative women also amniocentesis or any invasive fetal procedure if done in rh negative woman antd should be given so it cannot be done in rh negative woman that is also a false statement so what are the true statement statement number 1 and statement number 3 these are the true statement okay clear so let's quickly revise your invasive fetal testing so we have chorionic villus sampling cvs amniocentesis chordocentesis given side by side for you to compare okay chordocentesis is also called as P pubs pubs stands for percutaneous percutaneous umbilical blood sampling percutaneous umbilical blood sampling okay so see here chorionic villus sampling look at this catheter introduced from the uh, vagina transcervically okay it can be done from abdominal route also transabdominally it can be done but it doesn't matter choice of procedure so remember this image all right 
so it is done any time between 10 to 14 weeks it is not done before 10 weeks and it cannot be done beyond 14 weeks what is sample trophoblast is sample right so let's say for example if you have a, a woman with the first trimester combined screening positive and she is in the first trimester then at that point in time if you have to confirm for down syndrome you will have to go for a chorionic villus sample or let's say for example there is a woman who came with a quadruple test positive a quadruple test positive is done between 15 to 8 uh, 15 to 20 weeks at that point in time if she's having a screen test positive then the option of going for invasive fetal testing is amniocentesis which can be done anytime between 15 to 20 weeks if required it can be done beyond 20 weeks also but this is the most usual time when amniocentesis is being done the cells that are sampled are amniocytes epithelial cells or gastrointestinal mucosal cells which are lying suspended in the amniotic fluid all right this is an important clinical pointer this is an important relevant information because chorionic villus sampling when we do we try, we sample trophoblasts so trophoblasts are dividing cells okay they are dividing cells so when we use these cells uh, to go for karyotyping then the results can be there uh, you know within 48 hours you can get the report within 48 hours with chorionic villus sampling with amniocentesis, these are these are mature cells, okay? Amniocytes, epithelial or GI mucosal cells, they're not dividing cells. So these cells will have to be first cultured in the lab and then karyotyping will be done. So the report takes about seven to eight days to come. The karyotype report takes about seven to eight, uh, seven to ten days to come when we are going for amniocentesis. That's another important information. In chordocentesis, we are sampling the umbilical vein. Also remember that we are taking sample from the umbilical vein, not the umbilical artery. Okay. So when we sample the umbilical vein, we take the fetal blood. So we can check the fetal blood group also. We can check the fetal hemoglobin also. There are WBCs there in the blood. These WBCs can be cultured and used for karyotyping as well. And of course, this is the one thing that is going to provide confirmation of fetal anemia. Right? So in RH negative affected fetuses, RH negative affected fetuses who are having fetal anemia, this procedure is used to confirm fetal anemia and this procedure is used to achieve intrauterine transfusion. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, all these three procedures, CVS, amniocentesis, chordocentesis, all these three procedures can be used for diagnosis of genetic disorders, aneuploidies, fetal infections because we have fetal tissue. That fetal tissue can be subjected to infection testing, that fetal tissue can be subjected to genetic analysis also. With amniocentesis, fetal anemia, neural tube detection is possible but this is not the primary use of amniocentesis. Keep that in mind also. It is possible. With chorionic villus sampling, you can't check fetal anemia, okay? You can't comment on neural tube defects at all, all right? And with percutaneous umbilical blood sampling, you can confirm fetal anemia. We can also go for intrauterine transfusion, which are done in the setting of RH-affected fetus. This is done in this RH-affected fetus, in the setting of RH-affected fetus. So this can be done there okay but it will provide no information about neural tube defects also okay so keep this in mind comparative of chorionic villus sampling versus amnio versus cordo images are also important for your exams now let's have a look at the next question precocious puberty is defined as pubertal development before the age of 8 years what is the correct seek, uh, statement regarding pseudo precocious puberty? Yes. What is the correct statement regarding pseudo precocious puberty? Correct statement. It is gonadotropin dependent. Menses may not occur. Is always isosexual. Is always treated with GnRH analogs. Yes. Precocious puberty. Puberty and chapters and disorders of puberty are extremely hot topic right now. Okay, in every exam, they are repeatedly asking you questions on puberty and its disorders. So must revise topic and that is a very, uh, that is my focus area for today's discussion as well. 
yes precocious puberty puberty earlier than expected before the age of 8 years in girls what is the correct statement regarding pseudo precocious puberty there's something called as true precocious puberty also or central precocious puberty as well okay that's in fact the most common cause of precocious puberty right so what's your answer or should we directly start with the discussion should we directly start with the discussion if answer is not forthcoming yes so if precocious puberty is happening that is because of steroid hormones na all the pubertal changes are brought about by steroid hormones estrogen androgens right these are the steroid hormones that are bringing about changes of puberty it's either estrogens it is either androgens these are the steroid hormones right now during puberty the hypothalamus gets activated hypothalamus starts secreting gnrh in a pulsatile manner then gonadotropins are released and then we start producing hormones right so this is the sequence of puberty and this is what happens in a precocious puberty just that it tend, it it happened earlier than expected right so most common cause of you know if you look at the causes of precocious puberty most common cause is central that means that the hypothalamus or the pituitary right hypothalamus got activated earlier okay the gnrh secretion of uh, the, the the pulsatile secretion of gnrh uh, that should have started at the expected age of puberty it started earlier than usual so premature activation of this why it particularly happens we do not necessarily know so it's called as constitutional or idiopathic this is the most common cause right what is happening here the hypothalamus is getting activated prematurely okay that is what is happening in central precocious puberty then there can be certain cns tumors again these are rare these are rare situations where because of a central nervous system lesion the hypothalamus is triggered into you know activating earlier cns tumors can be of various kinds but one you need to remember here is a hamartoma a cns hamartoma so that could be responsible central nervous system infections or central nervous system trauma so they are central causes but again most common overall is the constitutional or idiopathic form of precocious puberty which is central so what is central meaning central meaning is started from here at the top it is gonadotropin dependent so the central or true type of precocious puberty is dependent on gonadotropins okay gnrh got activated then gonadotropins increased then estrogen increased right so obviously in a female if estrogen increases she will has pubertal development like that of a female only na so it is always isosexual okay and then cyclical ovulation that should have started at the expected age of expected age of puberty but now it has started earlier so cyclical ovulation will also start menses will also start right so this is true now compare it with peripheral now compare it with peripheral peripheral serve precocious puberty means that the gonads or anything in the periphery is secreting hormones okay so that could be the gonads that could be the um, adrenal glands right so there is some peripheral source of steroid hormone production okay so hypothalamus is not telling the gonads to secrete estrogen they are on their own some peripheral source of production of hormones most commonly here is a functional ovarian cyst most common here in this peripheral group is a functional ovarian cyst which produces estrogen okay and then there can be ovarian tumors which secrete estrogen ovarian tumors that secrete estrogen okay like granulosa cell tumor there can be theca or leydig cell tumors which secrete androgens there can be adrenal gland tumors which secrete androgens 
देर कैन बी नॉन क्लासिकल कॉन्जेनाइटल एड्रिनल हाइपर प्लेसिया नॉन क्लासिकल कॉन्जेनाइटल एड्रिनल हाइपर प्लेसिया वेर देर इज एक्सेसिव एंड्रोजेंस राइट सो इफ ईस्ट्रोजन इज गेटिंग सिक्रीटेड इन द पेरीफेरी देन देर विल बी आईसो सेक्शुअल प्यू बॉटल डेवलपमेंट If androgens are getting secreted in the periphery, then the uh, the then the young girl would have symptoms of androgen excess, hirsutism, you know, temporal balding, hair loss, sim symptoms of virilization will be there. Right? So heterosexual development will be there. Then other causes you need to mug up are severe primary hypothyroidism that can also be associated with the peripheral form of precocious puberty and McCune Albright syndrome. This is also isosexual. In this case, also it is going to be isosexual type. All right. So now you see, once you look at the list of causes, that with um, pseudo precocious puberty or peripheral precocious puberty, what kind of phenotypic development will take place? What kind of phenotypic expression will happen? Whether isosexual, whether heterosexual, it will depend upon what are the hormones that are getting secreted in the periphery. okay the secretion of these hormones from the periphery is not dependent on pituitary and gonadotropins and hypothalamus so it is gonadotropin independent peripheral precocious puberty pseudo precocious puberty is gonadotropin independent okay there is increase in sex steroids in the periphery it could be estrogen it could be androgen depending upon what is the underlying cause right and because these are increased there is feedback inhibition because these are increased there is feedback inhibition and there is decrease in gonadotropins keep that in mind could be heterosexual could be isosexual cyclical ovulation will not take place for ovulation to take place there has to be you know this follicular growth there has to be estradiol peak then there has to be lh surge and and then ovulation happens here all that is not happening here the constant levels of estrogen are maintained gonadotropins are decreased on the other hand cyclical ovulation doesn't happen menses however may or may not happen okay because if there is estrogen getting secreted in the periphery endometrial lining will get build up and once it will get build up maybe at a certain point in time it will get shed off so menses could be there but for, let's not call it menses also let's call it a withdrawal bleeding sort of a thing so withdrawal bleeding could be there of course it is not going to be true menses or like you know like that so keep that in mind so yes now now coming back to the question precocious puberty what is the correct statement regarding pseudo precocious puberty so the correct statement regarding pseudo precocious puberty is it is gonadotropin dependent false it is gonadotropin independent always isosexual false it can be isosexual or heterosexual always treated with gnrh analogs look at the causes when you have a central cause that like constitutional or idiopathic then we can obviously use gnrh analogs because they suppress the pituitary production they suppress the uh, you know they cause pituitary down regulation and they will cause ovarian suppression so gnrh analogs can be used here gnrh analogs can be used here okay in peripheral treatment of course in peripheral treatment of cause treatment will be guided towards treatment of cause isn't it right so will it always be treated with gnr channel loss no treatment of cause will be there that is what we are going to attempt first isn't it so the correct answer for this question is menses may not occur that's why the answer is menses may not occur now moving on to the next question now a woman is worried because she has been taking body building steroids through 10 weeks of her pregnancy these steroids have strong androgen content you explain to her that androgens can lead to which of the following developmental problems in case of a female embryo disorders of sexual development is a very very hot topic slowly they start 
they've started asking questions about disorders of sexual development also so i will try to help you around this topic as much as possible because this is a, a complicated topic there are many things that you have to remember in this scenario because you have to first of all know about you know normal development of sex then you have to think about what could be the abnormality so i'll try to uh, emphasize on the key important points at each step feel free to discuss discussion is what is going to help you so that i can know where your doubts are okay because just teaching this topic is 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 going to take 2 3 hours so woman is worried because she's been taking body building steroids now she's taking them through her 10 weeks of pregnancy and these are androgenic drugs these drugs can reach the fetus in case it is a female fetus that she is carrying then the female embryo could develop defects of okay now kishore b bhargavi b surgeon d and dr saab b mullerian ducts to regress quick revision baba quick revision bhul gaye ho to you people have forgotten your development of sex 46 xy fetus there is a sry gene here sry gene is not the only gene but that is the one gene that begins it all sry gene on the y chromosome that is not the only gene but yes that is the primary first stop gene right so sry gene will upregulate other genes and ultimately the gonads will become testes testes have certainly cell certainly cell secrete amh mullerian duct regresses ladic cells secrete testosterone because of testosterone wolfian duct develops into male internal genitalia this testosterone has to get transformed to 5 dht dihydrotestosterone by the enzyme 5 alpha reductase right and because of that external genitalia masculinizes okay now what happens in a genetically female fetus if it's a female fetus there is no sry instead other genes other genes which are required for development of ovaries those are upregulated instead the gonads develop into ovaries these ovaries are synthesizing if at all very little amounts of estrogen that is not taking part or that has got nothing to do with further development of sex primary important thing is no androgens primary important thing no androgens because there are no androgens wolfian duct regresses and external genitalia remains female see the default genitalia of a fetus is female when there are no androgens it remains female we're talking about external genitalia remains female and when there is no androgens wolfian duct regresses there is no amh because in the intrauterine life in the intrauterine life amh is coming from the amh is coming from the certainly cells of the developing testes there is no amh here mullerian duct develops mullerian duct develops into uterus tubes and upper part of vagina right now they are saying that a fetus has been exposed to androgens okay so why will mullerian ducts regress that's wrong mullerian duct will develop as expected fine will the gonads gonads differentiate into testes no in the pathway we saw that gonads get differentiated into testes because there are certain genes which needs to be upregulated so it's not like the gonads are going to develop into testes in a female fetus will the wolfian ducts develop will the wolfian duct develops you can say you can argue yes maybe wolfian ducts wolfian ducts also develop but it generally does not happen no it doesn't happen why because these androgens which uh, enter the fetus from the maternal systemic circulation so from the mother the androgens are reaching the female now these androgens are circulating in the blood stream of the fetus you see when the wolfian duct development is required now this testosterone when wolfian duct development is required local concentration of testosterone in the region of the developing ducts needs to be very very high so that does not happen when there is you know excess androgens in the female fetuses blood circulation so very typical here is that it is going to affect the development of the external genitalia of the 
फीमेल इट विल अफेक्ट द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द यूरोजेनाइटल साइनस ऑफ द फीमेल फीटस सो इट कैन लीड टू लेब्योस्क्रोटल फ्यूजन इट कैन लीड टू अ सिचुएशन वेर देर कैन बी एम्बिगुअस जेनाइटेलिया ओके देर कैन बी यू नो लेट्स ए for example there can be some clitoromegaly or a labioscrotal fusion so ambiguous genitalia can so the correct answer to this question is option number d right so are we clear on this yes option c bachche gonadal ridge will differentiate into testes if there is a sry gene or there is up regulation of other genes which are required in the process right that will not happen because of external androgens so external and external source of androgens is not going to make the gonadal ridge develop into testes okay so that is about option number c clear all right now once we are very very clear with this i want to move to the next question okay all right read this question carefully clues are hidden in the question and let's try let's not mug up any particular disorder let's just understand and try answering the question okay so we'll interact and we so any feedback please keep giving me so this is a 14 year old girl who's brought by her mother with the complaint of absent development and not having started menses the girl is tall well built she's experiencing deepening of voice there is clitoromegaly bilateral inguinal masses pubic hair are absent uterus can't be felt on per rectal examination and there is absent breast development also she is already 14 serum testosterone levels are markedly elevated what is the most likely cause dr saab and r more and s think again think again okay now let's before we start discussing the question let's let's just get a perspective here there is a young girl who's developing some male features at the time of her pubertal development okay fine so there is obviously a possibility of androgens get being involved in the process there's obviously a possibility of androgens being involved in the process so the question arises where are these androgens coming from androgens in a female body can come from the ovaries androgens can come from the adrenal glands and androgens could come in a situation where there is a disordered development of sex okay now let's have a look at the options you have option number you are saying pubic hair development under androgens peripheral conversion of testosterone to estrogen all those you are saying agreed agreed all your valid points you are giving but if there were androgen receptor deficiency ye what are these effects deepening of voice they are saying tall and well built also male muscle mass deepening of voice male like changes in pubertal which hormone is responsible for it testosterone right and as you're saying absent breast so can't be a right absent breast development because if it is androgen receptor deficiency there is breast development generally see i'm saying there is deepening of voice is saying well built male male like muscle build up okay and so deepening of voice is very concerning for me this is a very very direct testosterone related effect and 
Coffee serum testosterone levels are markedly elevated. They are telling you this. But if it's an androgen receptor deficiency, then even that testosterone should not be able to act. Isn't it? So it is not likely androgen receptor deficiency. Okay. Now, virilizations are caused by, yes, you are talking about other changes. Okay, you're talking about other changes like clitoromegaly, bilate and pubic hair are absent. Okay, now come to think of it, very, very important point. Why is nobody saying option number D, 5-alpha reductase deficiency? Why is nobody saying, talking about 5-alpha reductase deficiency? What will happen with 5-alpha reductase deficiency? What will happen with 5-alpha reductase deficiency? If there is going to be 5-alpha reductase deficiency, what will happen? Excess of testosterone, isn't it? Excess of testosterone will happen. Isn't it? So 5-alpha reductase deficiency fits more in this situation. Do you agree? Right? Because if androgen receptor deficiency would have been there, why is it not androgen receptor deficiency? Because I told you that androgen related action is coming, testosterone related action is coming, deepening of voice is coming, absent breast development is there. Right? So that's why it's not likely androgen receptor deficiency. But 5-alpha reductase deficiency can explain the increased serum testosterone levels. So that's why the answer here is... 5-alpha reductase deficiency, right? Now, what about 21-hydroxylase deficiency? 21-hydroxylase deficiency causes congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia where adrenal gland production of androgens increase, okay? And when that female reaches puberty, she is going to experience excess androgen effects, right? So, it causes congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia. But that doesn't interfere with the uterus development or that doesn't interfere with the, uh, you know, development of the female fetus, okay? So, keep that in mind. In congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the uterus is present and the karyotype is also normal 46XX and the ovaries are also normal and healthy. Okay, remember that congenital adrenal hyperplasia, excess androgens are coming from adrenal gland. Okay, it's a female with excess androgens coming from adrenal gland. Otherwise, everything is fine genetically and otherwise with the female. So, she is a female, she has ovaries, she has a uterus and everything is fine. It's just that excess androgens are coming from the adrenal glands. Okay, so that's why your answer is not 21 hydroxylase deficiency again the reason is why why is it not 21 hydroxylate deficiency another reason why it is not 21 hydroxylase deficiency is what about the bilateral inguinal masses whenever you find a situation that there is a young girl with bilateral inguinal masses these are undescended testes almost 99.9% .9 of the times. These bilateral inguinal masses are undescended testes. That's why I will not choose 21 hydroxylase deficiency as the answer. That is why that is not the answer. Okay. And now, Dr. Saab, why uterus not felt, right? Abhinia, why excess testosterone in 5-alpha reductase? Good, you are asking valid, valid questions. Let's just have a look at the other situations as well. Let's just have a look. Let's just get a perspective. Now, when we talk about why can't excess testosterone be converted to estrogen in 5-alpha reductase and breast development? Because there is too much of excess testosterone. 
okay there is too much of excess testosterone any aromatase enzyme has a capacity other and you know once the capacity of the enzyme is is overpowered overwhelmed then the effects start to happen right that's why okay so let's talk about disorders of 46 xy fetus okay this is the most hot topic most of your questions are probably going to be formed in the near future from this aspect only so when we have a genetic male fetus see here coming back to this chart okay what could go wrong what could go wrong is that the testes don't develop what could go wrong is that the testes don't develop if the testes don't develop if the testes don't develop what happens certainly cells don't develop ams doesn't develop and you know mullerian duct does not regress okay mullerian duct also does not regress leydig cells don't happen testosterone does not happen right so what happens instead this side no androgens no amh so there can be a genetically male fetus 46 xy gonadal dysgenesis we call it 46 xy gonadal dysgenesis swire syndrome swire syndrome 46 xy gonadal dysgenesis test is not formed only and nothing happens for the male sex development instead there are no androgens there is no amh and development absolutely entirely female internal genitalia female external genitalia everything female wolf and duck also regresses that is one thing that is point number 1 testes don't develop period 46 xy complete gonadal dysgenesis swire syndrome okay let's look at it further let's say what happens when there is androgen insensitivity syndrome in androgen insensitivity syndrome the androgen receptors are deficient okay so testosterone testes is also there testes is also there leydig cells are there certainly cells are there testosterone is also there amh is also there mullerian duct regresses mullerian duct regresses but testosterone is not able to act testosterone is not able to act because the receptors for testosterone they are deficient so this is two receptors for testosterone are deficient this is two so what happens wolfian duct doesn't develop wolfian duct doesn't develop okay external genitalia does not masculinize instead what happens instead instead what happens you have a female with external genitalia of female you have a female where the wolfian duct has also regressed right but now you have a female of androgen insensitivity syndrome where even mullerian duct has not developed absent uterus absent uterus tubes vagina okay absent uterus tubes vagina mullerian duct does not develop because it was a genetic male with testes but the androgens were not able to act so amh was there and mullerian duct regressed so this is point number 2 third point let's say let's say that testosterone can't be synthesized only let's say testosterone can't be synthesized only okay that means there are always enzymes no testosterone estrogen these are all steroid hormones and they require uh, you know enzymes to get synthesized let's say there is some enzyme deficiency and that is the enzyme that we were talking about here 17 alpha hydroxylase the 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme is required in androgen production so there is no androgen production let's say the androgen production only isn't there let's say the androgen production isn't there so it will present in a manner very similar to androgen insensitivity syndrome it will present look at this this leap listing look at the chart and listen it will present if there is a 17 hydroxylase deficiency or if for some reason testosterone is not getting synthesized it will present in a similar manner as androgen insensitivity syndrome but 
the raw material for estrogen production is also androgen so without the raw material estrogen production also doesn't happen without the raw material estrogen production also doesn't happen okay keep that in mind now the other possibility could be like we discussed could be 5 alpha reductase deficiency okay now if there is 5 alpha reductase deficiency what will happen if there is 5 alpha reductase deficiency what will happen everything else will happen fine in a genetic male fetus okay test is there certainly cells there amh there mullerian duct regresses leydig cells are there testosterone is also there wolfian duct also develops but there is 5 alpha reductase deficiency so external genitalia does not masculinize rest everything inside there is male internal genitalia and external genitalia is not masculinizing born and brought up as female in all these situations when the enzyme deficiencies when the receptor defects when all these defects are severe and complete it results in a complete female phenotype because have you heard about partial androgen insensitivity syndrome some and some receptors are there some receptors are not there so in partial androgen insensitivity insensitivity syndrome some androgen action can be there so it is all about androgen action if there is a female if there is a male fetus in which androgen action did not take place it will result in a phenotypical female fetus with slight differences as we have seen on this chart okay so keep that in mind okay so then we talk about disorders of 46 xy development meaning that there is we started with a genetic male fetus what went wrong what could be the disorder the disorder could be dependent on any of these uh, levels of abnormalities primarily the thing that is happening is that there is no androgen action taking place why is there no androgen action testes are not only there or testes are there but testosterone can't be synthesized or testosterone is getting synthesized but there are no receptors for testosterone or testosterone is also there receptors are also there but the enzyme 5 alpha reductase deficiency is there okay so these are the subtle subtle points which is it is all about concepts the thing is that you can't you can't try to mug it up mugging up you, you it gets lost i mean i i even i at this point in time cannot mug it up but i you have to understand that these could be the disorders and if clinical questions are given around these things then you have to look at key words in the question like here for me and now coming back to the question here for me the keyword was bilateral inguinal masses that was my first keyword bilateral inguinal masses when i see i should think these are in a female these are these are undescended test so now i know that this is 46 xy of course i will take a karyotype to confirm of course that goes without saying that 100% you'll have to confirm that these are testes by doing a karyotype in the female then only you will know that she is actually 46 xy most likely undescended testes this is 46 xy karyotype okay so now i start thinking what could go wrong defects in androgen action okay like i told you it can't be congenital adrenal hyperplasia because uterus 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 should be present in congenital adrenal hyperplasia they saying uterus cannot be felt on per rectal examination so probably the uterus is absent okay so that ruled out congenital adrenal hyperplasia for me okay that ruled out congenital adrenal hyperplasia for me 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency if there is 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency then there are no androgens being synthesized so there should be no androgen effects also so that rules out 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency for me then i have to think about androgen receptor deficiency and 5 alpha reductase deficiency in this situation i did not choose androgen receptor deficiency because there is deepening of voice which is a very typical testosterone related change so definitely testosterone receptors must be there that is why deepening of voice is taking place that rules out androgen receptor deficiency for me and i think about 
फाइव आल्फा रिडक्टेज डेफिशंस ओके so a quick revision i have summarized it for you so that you can go back so that you can go back and revise this so i have summarized this for you disorders of 46 xy development when there is a complete gonadal dysgenesis there are dysgenetic testes mostly they are intra abdominal but they can be anywhere in the inguinal canal also uterus is present in complete gonadal dysgenesis or swyer syndrome 46 xy swyer syndrome yes deepening of voice means male like voice yes external genitalia is female complete androgen insensitivity syndrome gonads testes undescended in the intra abdominal cavity or in the inguinal canal or even underneath the labia maybe uterus absent phenotype female androgen synthesis deficiency testes same same five alpha reductase deficiency same same right in all these situations if the deficiency is complete in case of complete androgen insensitivity uh, insensitivity or complete androgen synthesis deficiency complete five alpha reductase deficiency the patient will be the girl, young child would be born and brought up as a female problem will be when she'll reach puberty problem will be when she'll reach puberty in puberty what are we expecting that the girl should develop secondary sexual characteristics and start to menstruate what will happen breast development in dysgenetic uh, in uh, gonadal dysgenesis like swyers there's no source of um, there's no source of uh, estrogen right so breast development absent menses absent but pubic hair are present because from adrenal gland okay pubic hair are present because of production from adrenal glands height is tall estrogen deficiency is there because of estrogen deficiency fsh and lh levels are elevated complete androgen insensitivity syndrome breast development is present menses are absent there is no uterus to bleed pubic hair are absent because pubic hair are androgen dependent hair androgen action is required right height is going to be tall uh, estrogen in them is going to be in the normal range because of production or peripheral conversion of the testosterone to estrogen and the serum testosterone is going to be in the male range it is going to be increased androgen synthesis deficiency if there is then breast development is absent why because i told you raw material is androgen if there is no raw material there is no estrogen also so they have no breast development menses are also absent pubic hair are also absent because pubic hair are androgen dependent hair so they are not there right height is tall there is decreased testosterone decreased estrogen and fsh and lh is going to be increased in these uh, patients with androgen in uh, synthesis deficiency because peripherally there are no steroids right decrease testosterone decrease estrogen so that is why feedback stimulation increased fsh and lh 5 alpha reductase deficiency similar sorry 5 alpha reductase deficiency absolutely similar differentiating point increase in testosterone to dht ratio because testosterone will be markedly elevated in these particular situations testosterone is so markedly elevated that even it eat it even leads to uh, because when uh, you know when the testosterone is in very high excess amounts then that can lead to atrophy of the breast tissue as well so breast development does not take place in these in these women okay now you also have to who somebody somebody asked me uh, why can't excess testosterone converted to estrogen in 5 alpha reductase and cause breast development bachcha that's that you asked such a valid question abhinay an excellent question you asked see i'll give you the reason the reason is abhinay if you're still listening to this lecture the reason is in androgen insensitivity syndrome androgens are not acting on anything because the androgen receptors are not there right so the androgens are not able to exert their own effects rather whatever androgen is there is getting converted to estrogen and estrogens are acting in 5 alpha reductase deficiency there is no deficiency of androgen receptors so these excess androgens are able to act on tissue these excess androgens are able to act on tissue right 
they are able to act on tissues that is why androgen related effects can be seen like male muscle mass deepening of voice breast development becomes absent in these women and pubic hair are absent because pubic hair required the, the tissues of the tissues require 5 alpha reductase so pubic hair is absent okay clear so this is the shortest possible way that we can remember these disorders of 46 xy development okay understand them and if ever put in a situation like this very clinical questions are asked eliminate by key pointers eliminate by key pointers that is how it is going to be done next question 16 year old girl is seen with primary amenorrhea her secondary sexual characters are well developed local exam is normal uterus is felt on per rectal examination serum fsh tsh prolactin are also normal pregnancy test is also negative she is given a progesterone withdrawal test after which she has her first periods what is the most likely cause of her amenorrhea very simple question very simple question straight forward question there's a primary amenorrhea in a young girl everything is fine okay so when we have primary amenorrhea we check for breast development then we check if uterus is present or not right then if there is um, you we go for a hormonal profile also all these things we do everything has come out to be normal pregnancy test is negative she is given a progesterone withdrawal test after which she has her first period what is the most likely answer of course if there is no hype rule out hypoestrogenism no estrogen is there that is why her secondary sexual characters are well developed so that's not the answer pituitary tumor if there is a pituitary tumor it will lead to decrease fsh no it is not there gonadal dysgenesis no if the gonads are only dysgenetic she will not have not she will not have estrogen and then she will not have breast development she will all that will have to be there right in gonadal dysgenesis also hormone levels are going to be affected so obviously it's just nothing but constitutional delay in menarche it's a constitutional delay in menarche okay very good as primed uterus very good estrogen is there estrogen has already acted upon the endometrial lining all we did was give progesterone from outside i want to twist this a little bit okay i want to ask you if there is a situation where there is let's say in this situation only let's say in this situation she did not have a withdrawal bleeding after giving progesterone what would you think of let's say in this same situation i'll twist it a little bit if no withdrawal bleeding on progesterone what will you think of just think logically think logically and i know you know the answer and you can give the answer to me in this same situation and and we can we can look at the clue that he gave na he said primed uterus s said primed uterus so if there is bleeding happening on giving progesterone that means estrogen has already acted upon the endometrial lining so that when i gave the progesterone from outside she had a withdrawal bleeding if there is no withdrawal bleeding on progesterone what would you think of estrogen plus progesterone test next wo to secondary amenorrhea mein karte hain as but estrogen why will you give estrogen na you you know that she is having secondary sexual characteristics check serum estradiol level estrogen feel give first 3 weeks of estrogen then progesterone i want to know what will you think of what will you think of the possibility what could be the possibility one thing is rare the other thing is is probably comp yeah the other thing is common in indian scenario i'll give you clues malnutrition malnutrition okay and the other clue i want to give you is past history of tuberculosis bhargavi hypogonadotropic asherman asherman you are right bhargavi if it would have been hypogonadotropic to yaar ye fsh aur lh level to fir would have been no, not been normal na hai na bhargavi hypogonadotropic fsh level would have been increased in hypogonadotropic hyper 
sorry hypogonadotropic you are saying ha huh? so then fsh level would have been low na i am saying in this situation in this very same situation they are saying fsh is normal in hypogonadotropic i agree with you when there is estrogen deficiency withdrawal bleeding on progesterone does not take place i agree with you there but in this scenario they are saying serum fsh normal then in that situation we are looking at the endometrium we are looking at the endometrium hypoplastic uterus is one possibility but then some endometrium building will be there na in hypoplastic uterus as well but yes potentially there addisons yeah severe if some some medical chronic illness which is leading to hypothalamic suppression that is also a very likely possibility i agree with you there but then some hormonal abnormality should also come na baba right if there is a chronic illness which is causing hypothalamic suppression then fsh level should be low na i'm saying fsh level normal in this same situation if no withdrawal bleeding or progesterone i'll think about the endometrium i'll think about the possibility of genital tuberculosis in our setting and very good surgeon lack of receptors in the endometrium very rare but potential it's very very rare extremely rare receptor endometrium receptor defects or you know congenital absence of endometrium so endometrium defects which are very very rare okay so with me you have all gone through the chart of delayed puberty or primary amenorrhea but with these two questions we have gone one step ahead okay we have gone one step ahead in evaluating cases of delayed puberty or primary amenorrhea but i'll just quickly revise this with you because again questions can be around this also so breast development is the first thing that you see whether present whether absent if the breasts are well developed that means there is no estrogen deficiency that means estrogen deficiency is not there estrogen is present if there is history suggestive of cryptomenorrhea and the uterus is given present check for the bluish bulge at the introitus okay if there is a bluish bulge at introitus it is an imperforate hymen fairly evident clinical diagnosis right or per rectal examination you can see, feel we can feel a bulge in front of the rectum okay on doing a per rectal examination a bulge can be felt anterior to the rectum and in this uh, in the previous uh, uh, in the neat pg they had asked this question that the bulge is felt throughout the length of the vagina or just in the upper part of the vagina that goes on to tell us the location of the outflow tract obstruction right so introitus if it is normal or there is uh, you know a bulge that is felt higher up that means it's likely a transverse vaginal septum if the uterus is absent the two possibilities to consider more more commonly are mullerian agenesis or complete androgen insensitivity syndrome however we just discussed the other situations also where disorders of sexual development can also happen but in all those disorders of sexual development uh, which were let's say testosterone deficiency i'll just go back to the chart where we had androgen synthesis deficiency where we had 5 alpha reductase deficiency the breast development is absent so that is another important point so here in the chart if your breast development is present and your uterus is absent and there's a blind vaginal pouch we think about the possibility of mullerian agenesis versus can complete androgen insensitivity syndrome the 100% diagnosis can be made by karyotype only serum testosterone levels can be helped to make the diagnosis also because in complete androgen insensitivity syndrome they are going to be in the male range and uh, pubic hair are going to be present in mullerian agenesis they are going to be absent in complete androgen insensitivity syndrome and yes you are right supra pubic swelling can be an abdominal lump can be seen in both yes you are right as abdominal lump can be seen in both that's also correct because abdominal lump is because of the blood collection inside the vagina in the blood collection inside the uterus hematometra hemato colpos that is the cause for the uh, you know for the abdominal lump so supra pubic swelling abdominal lump can be there in both when the breast development is absent okay 
then we definitely go for the full hormonal profile workup fsh lh estradiol prolactin and tsh levels also should be done but if they ask you one hormone the one most important hormone is fsh because fsh helps you streamline the differential diagnosis into two different directions so if your fsh is high then of course it is gonadal cause it is gonadal dysgenesis of some kind or the other if your height is short karyotype is given 45 xo this is the most common karyotype sometimes there can be turner mosaic also with 45 x and 46 xx karyotype so that is also there so streak ovaries are there hypoplastic uterus is there diagnosis is turners very straightforward clear cut diagnosis of turners is becoming right but always always we always go for a karyotype to confirm okay we can't confirm just like that always karyotype will be needed to 100% confirm if there's a normal height and the fsh is raised then there can be all other different forms of gonadal dysgenesis 46 xx gonadal dysgenesis 46 xy gonadal dysgenesis squires which we just discussed there can be mixed gonadal dysgenesis or even the rare 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency interesting interesting to note 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency in a female fetus this enzyme deficiency can happen in the female fetus also then even though the fetus is female she will have the uterus and everything she will have the uterus and everything all that will be fine but then there is going to be no raw material for estrogen production that is going to be there so the rare 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency can also be there then we have the situation where the fsh is low when the fsh is low one should always rule out pituitary and hypothalamic causes right so one should rule out cns tumors uh, functional hypothalamic dysfunction right for example you know excessive uh, chronic illness eating disorders malnutrition and everything and these will generally have low fsh values if they say height is tall anosmia is there then it is kolman syndrome straight away and if the height is short low normal fsh range constitutional delay like it was mentioned in the question you only say when everything else is ruled out it is a diagnosis of exclusion most of the types all right fine so this is how we are going to approach these questions step by step all right now moving on to the next question previous year mcq previous previous year ini ct question true statement regarding anti mullerian hormone is what is the true statement regarding anti mullerian hormone it correlates with outcome of ivf patient it's done on day 2 of the cycle it's a lipoprotein secreted by granulosa cells of preantral antral follicles it decreases the sensitivity of preantral follicles to respond to fsh what's the true statement what is the true statement now you know you know all these four options are so wonderful because they help you revise everything about amh this anti mullerian hormone that they are talking about right now is the one that is released in the adult reproductive years okay from the ovary where in the ovary from the granulosa cells of the smaller follicles which are the smaller follicles preantral antral follicles that is true in option number c but it is not a lipoprotein it's a glycoprotein so it is not a lipoprotein okay so that's why this option is wrong right now since it is secreted from the preantral and antral follicles they basically reflect the amount of residual follicular pool so they are a marker of ovarian reserve they are a marker of ovarian reserve okay so they are used for ovarian reserve testing in women with infertility right so basically when we have amh value serum amh values less than 1 nanogram per ml we call it as poor reserve we call it as poor poor reserve okay that's correct that's correct okay that simply means you know if if the reserve is so poor does that mean that she cannot be given ivf treatment no and it is not even correlate it does not even correlate with the outcome of ivf treatment i mean serum amh less than 1 could be 0.7 0.5 0.2 0.1 or whatever it will decline over time right so the lesser it is 
the poorer is the result the lesser it is of course when it is too low then definitely it will correlate with the outcome of ivf treatment but it generally reflects that the, since the residual follicular pool is so low since the reserve is so low she'll probably require more amount of gonadotropins to achieve stimulation that is what it means doesn't mean that ivf treatment will definitely be successful or will never be successful in a woman with poor reserve so it correlates with the outcome of ivf treatment that is also not an entirely correct statement because if it is a correct statement that would be mean that would mean ke bhai people who have good ovarian reserve will have always success people who have poor ovarian reserve they they have no chances of success right that that's not a entirely true statement okay keep that in mind it is done on day 2 of cycle it can be done any time during the month so it is not done on day 2 of the cycle that's also an incorrect statement it can be done any time in the month it is a gonadotropin independent value it is the levels of serum amh are gonadotropin independent okay then it decrease now so by that logic only option number d is left it decreases the sensitivity of preantral follicles to respond to fsh interesting interesting remember in menstrual cycle only one dominant follicle is selected there are so many follicles growing but one dominant follicle is selected there is some role yes that maybe the smaller preantral follicles which are secreting amh that is not allowing all them to respond to fsh but there is one dominant follicle which has gained the maximum fsh receptors that continues to grow so this is a true statement it decreases the sensitivity of preantral follicles to respond to fsh otherwise all preantral follicles would become dominant follicles but we have in menstrual cycle only one dominant right so it was a tricky question could have been answered by uh, eliminating but then of course the options were so close like whether it is a lipoprotein or it is actually a glycoprotein so this was it has this this question are very close options it was a interesting question however okay so with this we complete this question now let's move on to the next question infertility hot topic please revise infertility length and breadth of infertility for your ini cet they are asking questions on infertility also actually na endocrinology hormones and everything they've become very very important a couple is being evaluated for infertility they've been trying to conceive for past 4 years the husband semen analysis is normal the woman herself is 32 years old read up the question s fsh receptors switch to lh receptors on granulosa cells they are not switched per se receptor can't change they are not switched per se but fsh induces lh receptors on lh receptors to appear on uh, granulosa cells that's true that's true okay so coming to the question couple being evaluated for infertility they've been trying to conceive for past 4 years now okay so couple husband and woman husband semen analysis is normal male out woman is 32 years old she is obese her cycles are regular but she has severe congestive dysmenorrhea pelvis exam shows fixed retroverted uterus with nodularity in the pouch of douglas she has undergone multiple cycles of ovulation induction in the past what would you like to do next test for cervical factor perform mri pelvis perform laparoscopy proceed with ovulation induction and iui what do you think you should do tell me now in this question first think about okay there is infertility the clinical findings are suggestive of endometriosis suggestive of endometriosis so far we are agreeing on this she has undergone multiple cycles of ovulation induction in the past also what would you like to do next test for cervical factor in clinical practice nowadays we're not doing cervical factor testing anymore this is out i don't think this will be an answer anywhere in your question we're not doing it perform mri pelvis the 
I mean, do you confirm endometriosis on MRI? You don't. You don't confirm it on MRI. You don't do MRI. It is going to give you no uh, specific information. Now, the option is to perform a laparoscopy, confirm endometriosis. The other option is delay laparoscopy and proceed with ovulation induction and IUI. Before IUI, it is very, very important. Bhai, IUI, if you're going to do intrauterine insemination, tube should be open. There is no information here right now given about the patency of the tubes, whether the tubes are open or not. Because if the tubes are closed, IUI is, you can't do IUI. Yaar. You put the sperms inside the uterus, but then the sperms have to reach the fallopian tubes and fertilization is going to happen in the tubes. Na? So if the tubes are blocked, and IUI is not an option. So performing laparoscopy will help me confirm endometriosis. Performing laparoscopy, I can do the uh, uh, tubal patency testing in the same setting. So I go for option number C, perform laparoscopy. All of these investigations, all of these clinical conditions, you have read about them. It is just how now to best use investigation. Okay, and investigation will cater to the specific scenario. Moving on to the next question. A couple is being evaluated for infertility and the male partner has azuspermia. On further workup, he is found to have absence of vast difference in seminal recycles. What is the most likely cause? This is a direct previous year MCQ. I have not added or deleted anything from this question. Okay. Male partner has azuspermia. Okay. On clinical examination, he is found to have absence of vast difference as well as seminal recycles. What is the most likely cause? Direct MCQ. Coleman syndrome. Can Coleman syndrome affect males? Yes. Coleman syndrome can affect males also. Okay. In fact, it affects males more often than it affects female. Right. So, it is a genetic def defect with congenital deficiency of GnRH, delayed puberty. So, Coleman syndrome in the male can also cause delayed pubertal development in the male, you know, decreased spermatogenesis, therefore infertility, right. And Coleman syndrome here will also have anosmia. Anosmia, Red green color blindness, and there is going to be deficiency of GnRH. There's going to be male infertility, so it can affect the males also, right? But it the vast difference will not be absent or anything, okay? It, that doesn't affect that. Kleinfelter syndrome is 47XXY males, extra X in the males right so with Kleinfelter syndrome what do we see we see that there is primary gonadal dysgenesis sorry primary gonadal failure now we have with Kleinfelter syndrome primary gonadal failure okay so there are small atrophic maybe undescended testes plus minus undescended testes okay so that is what we see in Kleinfelter syndrome Okay, cystic fibrosis on the other hand, the situation that they're describing here is congenital bilateral absence of vast difference. Okay, now about two third of these patients with congenital bilateral absence of vast difference, they are found to have associated mutation in the CFTR gene. Okay, so CFTR gene mutation and that can be associated with cystic fibrosis also. Right, so that's why answer is cystic fibrosis here so cbavd congenital bilateral absence of vast difference associated with cftr gene mutation the same thing that leads to cystic fibrosis also so that can be that's why the answer is cystic fibrosis by chromosome micro deletions again will lead to primary gonadal failure will lead to primary gonadal failure okay that's correct will lead to primary gonadal failure that's correct but then absence of vast difference in seminal recycles, that won't happen if there are Y chromosome micro deletions. So quick revision of what can be framed as questions in azoospermia. So in an azoospermia situation where there is absence of sperms or even let's say when there is severe oligospermia, okay, when there is severe oligospermia also, always focus on what are the important clues they are giving you in history, any important clues on examination and a hormonal profile is done. A full hormonal profile is done, right, keep that in mind, uh, serum testosterone, FSH, LH, prolactin, TSH, everything needs to be done. Uh, your hormone which will give you an idea about the possibility of um, you know whether it is a primary gonadal failure or whether it is a pituitary hypothalamic cause is mainly FSH. 
okay so look here if all your hormones are decreased if all your hormones are decreased it is probably a pituitary hypothalamic cause which is very rare in males only about 1 to 2% uh, cases will have a pituitary hypothalamic cause most of the times it will be this fsh is increased and testosterone is decreased that means there is primary gonadal failure then in that situation one should always go for a karyotype because there is a high possibility of klinefelter syndrome okay one should test for y chromosome micro deletions as well now y chromosome micro deletions is very very important to note here highlight it asterisk okay now these y chromosome micro deletions these y chromosome micro deletions y chromosome micro deletions they are present on the long arm of y chromosome long arm of y chromosome and i just want you to remember that there can be various areas on this on this particular uh, y chromosome where there can be micro deletions but most typically azf region azf region this is azoospermia factor azoospermia factor so just remember these slight one liner pointers right now the other importance of y chromosome micro deletions is that these micro deletions they get transmitted from the male to the male offspring so if there is a particular man with y chromosome micro deletions and he wants to go for ivf using his own sperm then we need to explain them to him that these y chromosome micro deletions you know they they get transmitted across generations so if if he has a male fetus the male his male offspring will also have y y chromosome micro deletion so this needs to be counseled so that is why this is an important information okay then there could be testicular trauma testicular injury undescended testes cryptorchidism and all these various kinds which are causing primary gonadal failure then the point is that testosterone is decreased spermatogenesis is affected and as a result of which fsh and lh levels are raised if the hormone levels are normal that means that there is outflow tract obstruction when the hormone levels are normal there can be two situations actual actual obstruction actual obstruction or there can be congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens okay trans rectal ultrasound can help us identify we can perform a trans rectal ultrasound all right congenital bilateral absence of vas vas deferens can be felt on clinical examination also so vas if there is absence of vas deferens then the vas deferens will not be uh, palpable okay so vas deferens is not palpable in that situation so there are two possibilities actual outflow tract obstruction or congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens if the outflow tract obstruction is above the level of seminal vesicles okay so i mean i'll probably have to just maybe this is the testes this is the epididymis okay vas deferens and then this is the seminal vesicle this is the ejaculatory duct opening into the penis okay so just quick 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 so this is the epididymis this is the vas deferens this is the seminal vesicle duct of seminal vesicle and this here is the ejaculatory duct ejaculatory duct which opens into the urethra right so if the obstruction is above the level of the seminal vesicles if the obstruction is somewhere here okay then what will happen the semen volume is going to be normal because much of the semen volume semen contains sperms and fluid right seminal fluid so much of the seminal fluid is coming from where so it is coming from the seminal vesicles So if the obstruction is above the level of seminal vesicle the semen volume is also normal and there is going to be fructose also fructose is also coming from the seminal vesicle secretions only so fructose is going to be present in that situation okay if the outflow tract obstruction is above the seminal vesicles i'm talking about situation here but if the outflow tract obstruction is at the level of the ejaculatory duct so if there is ejaculatory duct obstruction if there is ejaculatory duct obstruction then what will happen then 
sperms are also not entering into the uh, urethra and on top of that seminal fluid secretions are also not happening uh, fructose is also not entering so the semen volume is going to be low fructose is going to be absent in the semen sample and these seminal vesicles are going to be dilated dilated seminal vesicles are going to be there so that will make the diagnosis of ejaculatory duct obstruction if there is congenital bilateral absence of vast difference then this vast difference is not there this part is not there seminal vesicles are not there right so same thing semen volume is also low because seminal vesicles are not there fructose is also absent because seminal vesicles are not there so seminal vesicles are they're not they're not going to be dilated as an ejaculatory duct obstruction because if there's ejaculatory duct obstruction then the seminal vesicles get dilated because the contents of the seminal vesicle secretions they are not draining into the penile urethra right so this is a flow chart all right now final situation final situation i'll just add one more pointer to it final situation i'll just add one more pointer to it let's say there's a situation where there is low semen volume low semen volume fructose is also absent okay and there is no ejaculatory duct obstruction and there is also no CBAVD. Nothing is there. What, what could be the reason? What could be the reason? Think about, think about the possibility of retrograde ejaculation. Retrograde ejaculation meaning ejaculation entering the ejaculate entering into the urinary bladder instead. So in this situation, post uh, post um, post ejaculatory urine examination can be done if there are if to see if there are some sperms in the urine. So think about retrograde ejaculation, which can be seen with post ejaculatory urine analysis. Okay, so dear friends, male infertility is becoming again very very important now s yes, if there's a question asking how would you differentiate between testicular and obstructive cause of infertility and the hormone is asked then if there are multiple hormones given then the best hormone to choose is fsh i've seen that question if they yeah if they have fsh also mentioned and they have uh, testosterone also mentioned and they're asking you to differentiate between testicular and obstructive causes or testicular and non-obstructive causes then go for fsh because see testosterone is going to be decreased in both pre-testicular and gonadal failure also okay lh however is going to give you a better idea because sorry fsh is going to give you a better idea so fsh is going to be increased in cases of primary gonadal failure and FSH is going to be decreased in cases of pituitary and hypothalamic cases and in normal hormones FSH is also going to be normal so in that situation best to choose is FSH okay however even FSH alone that is just like you know okay one time that question was asked so best to choose FSH but then one has to go for the full hormonal profile okay now coming to the next question which of the following is incorrect regarding the pathophysiology of preeclampsia previous year question just previous year last year question which of the following is incorrect regarding the pathophysiology of preeclampsia yes in my previous neat pg sessions i don't know if you if you saw those sessions but i did talk about pathophysiology of preeclampsia as well so which of the following is incorrect incorrect Yes, anybody attempting, anybody attempting. At least in we know for one thing for sure in preeclampsia there is hypertension and there is vasoconstriction. Okay, we know for one thing for sure preeclampsia there is hypertension, preeclampsia there is vasoconstriction. Basic pathology knowledge. Thromboxane is a vasoconstrictor. Thromboxane is a vasoconstrictor. Prostacycline is a vasodilator. So this ratio should increase, not decrease. There should be more of vasoconstriction than vasodilatation. So this ratio should increase. So option D is incorrect. 
option b is incorrect that's your answer there because the rest of the things are difficult to mug up sflt1 increases vgf decreases these are true but then again at the point in time in examination they can be difficult to mug up decrease nitric oxide nitric oxide is also a vasodilator so if nitric oxide is decreased there is vasoconstriction that makes sense and then thromboxane and prostacyclin as well so i i want you to if you want to remember these things remember what is essentially happening in the preeclampsia so we discussed in the previous sessions also that in preeclampsia especially with early onset preeclampsia there is incomplete invasion of spiral arteries by the extravillous cytotrophoblast that's also previous year neat pg question okay so there is incomplete in, in, uh, invasion there is defective vascular remodeling so in effect what happens is that there is placental ischemia and wherever there is ischemia inflammatory mediators are released and these inflammatory mediators cause endothelial damage and this is the center piece of the pathology endothelial damage is the center piece of the entire pathology okay keep that in mind so when we talk about this incomplete uh, you know trophoblast invasion there is this discussion as to why this incomplete trophoblast invasion is taking place right so there are factors which are angiogenic factors which favor this invasion so those factors are decreased there are anti angiogenic factors which inhibit this invasion so those factors are increased anti angiogenic factors inhibit the invasion of trophoblasts and these factors are increased like sflt1 and serum endoglin right so that is there now once endothelial damage happens after that what happens after endothelial damage wherever there is going to be endothelial damage the fluid is going to leak out there is going to be tissue edema because this endothelial damage is going to happen in many systemic circulations okay not just limited to the placenta blood systemic circulation right so fluid is going to leak out there is going to be hemo concentration right endothelial cell damaged damaged endothelial cells will not be able to release nitric oxide so decrease nitric oxide right then these are platelets that are activated platelets that are activated are going to you know come at the site of endothelial damage right so microvascular thrombosis will also happen microvascular thrombosis will also happen so thrombotic sequelae platelets activated release more of thromboxane okay damaged endothelial cells it is the endothelial cells which secrete prostacyclin decrease prostacyclin right so the uh, it is basic simple first year second year physiology right so decrease nitric oxide decrease prostacyclin and increase thromboxane and all this all this imbalances all this endothelial damage ultimately contributes to this vasoconstriction vasoconstriction so you see that at the tissue level what is happening at the tissue level vasoconstriction at the tissue level tissue edema at the tissue level microvascular thrombosis so ultimately there is tissue necrosis there is tissue ischemia and there are ischemic sequelae na and these are responsible for the various end organ changes that we see these are responsible for the various end organ changes in different different organ systems that we see in a patient of pre eclampsia okay so this is the answer here now let's have a look at the next question now there is a 35 year old primary she is seen in emergency at 32 weeks with blood pressure of 160 by 110 right she is 32 weeks blood pressure 160 by 110 urine albumin is 1 plus respiratory rate 14 chest is clear her initial lab report show hb of 10 tlc of 4000 platelet count of 80000 lft kft are normal she had no headache blurring of vision or epigastric pain so currently there are no signs and symptoms of impending eclampsia but she is definitely having severe preeclampsia isn't it she is definitely having severe preeclampsia so we have also evaluated the fetus ultrasound for fetal well being show that the fetus is growth restricted parameters corresponding to 28 weeks with oligohydroamnios absent end diastolic flow on doppler nst is reactive what is the next step what is the next step so repeat doppler after one week 
absent and diastolic now this requires you to think about two things at the same time one is preeclampsia preeclampsia that is leading to the fetal growth restriction okay the fetus is so growth restricted that now she the fetus is having doppler abnormalities like absent and diastolic low so repeating doppler after one week is too late okay so repeating doppler after one week is too late when we have absent and diastolic flow on doppler patient has to be admitted and daily doppler has to be done daily monitoring has to be done in the form of daily nst maybe even twice daily or thrice daily nst may be required so monitor with biophysical profile yes i would like to do that but let's have a look at the other options also somebody dr saab you're saying option number c admit antihypertensive magnesium sulfate and immediate delivery that's one thing other is admit antihypertensive steroid magnesium sulfate and monitor with nst and bpp why we are forgetting she is 32 weeks she is 32 weeks at initial presentation of course i am going to admit her get the bp under control but i also need to take care of the fetus now i need to give at least i need to at least be able to buy 48 hours for the steroid administration to get completed i'll start with profile active magnesium sulfate and i'll monitor with nst and bpp and at any point in time that the woman's situation is worsening or the baby baby's uh, uh, monitoring shows that the nst has become non reactive or biophysical profile is poor now if any time any abnormality happen then i'll give up the conservative management but i'll at least start with settling the patient down first isn't it so admit antihypertensive steroid administration magnesium sulfate and monitor with nst and bpp that's the best choice answer here keep that in mind okay so to summarize mild preeclampsia bp well control we deliver after 38 37 completed weeks 37 completed weeks if in a case of severe preeclampsia we always admit okay we always consider the complete maternal fetal assessment we consider magnesium sulfate also we treat the hypertension also if she is already more than 34 weeks no no doubt we have to deliver her immediately if she is less than 34 weeks at least start with steroids frequent labs watch for signs and symptoms of intent impending eclampsia and then perform daily monitoring if all goes well we can take the pregnancy as far as 34 weeks and if any contraindications develop to conservative management get started with the conservative management but if anything goes wrong we will leave the conservative management and deliver so what are these any contraindications to conservative management here uncontrolled severe hypertension impending eclampsia eclampsia help pulmonary edema placental abruption dic non reassuring fetal distress also fetal demise these are all contraindications to conservative management in the first place the ones that are highlighted in blue the ones that are highlighted in blue in this situation we try to stabilize for 48 hours at least to cover complete steroids at least to complete steroids okay in the conditions highlighted with red in these situations we go for immediate delivery after giving at least one dose of steroid okay and we were talking about situation when the fetus is less than 34 weeks all right so this is the answer to your question here all right so even if you don't remember the list it is fairly simple to understand that right now the patient is 32 weeks and right now you know there is no immediate reason why we should go for immediate delivery we can at least wait you know try to settle her down and you know give the steroid cover at least so that's your answer here now moving on let's come to the next question which of the following statements are incorrect regarding magnesium sulfate in preeclampsia previous year mcq previous year ini cet mcq incorrect regarding magnesium sulfate in preeclampsia it causes uterine relaxation is in dose dependent manner that's correct 
more the dosage of magnesium sulfate so the dosage of magnesium sulfate that we are typically using it is seen that uh, you know um, when you talk about levels of magnesium sulfate in serum uh, the tocolytic or uterine relaxation action of magnesium sulfate generally comes at around levels of 8 to 10 milli equivalents per liter so it is in a dose dependent manner this is a true statement it has anti convulsant and anti hypertensive action you don't even need to look at the other options it is a centrally acting anti convulsant that's true but it is not an anti hypertensive drug so it does not have anti hypertensive action this is a false statement so which of the following statements are incorrect option number b is incorrect okay in renal dysfunction let's say for example there is a woman with severe preeclampsia she is having renal dysfunction also even then initial loading dose can be given magnesium sulfate is very very important maybe there is a patient with eclampsia she is having decreased urine output why you can give the initial loading dose maintenance doses then are titrated later according to the gfr so when the serum creatinine levels are raised when the serum creatinine levels are raised we are going to go for monitoring of uh, you know magnesium uh, levels in serum to check if um, the levels are within the normal range or not to further give maintenance dosages so that can be titrated but loading dose can definitely be given this is a true statement and maintenance dose is given for 24 hours after delivery or last convulsion whichever is later this is also a true statement okay so this was a direct repeat question this was a previous year question right now let's have a look at this question a 37 year old unmarried woman comes for routine gynae checkup she is sexually active and taking ocps for contraception her mother had breast cancer at 55 years of age and sister had ovarian cancer at 40 years of age what advice do you give her now if you watch my onco series okay then you would know that i have discussed all the gynae cancers s does it help in prevention of rds also ma'am no prevention of cerebral palsy neuroprotection in extreme preterm extreme pre preterm newborns okay who are less than 29 weeks otherwise we don't give for every preterm patient case okay and no role in prevention of rds for prevention of rds steroids are there okay so what do you do ocps are protective against endometrial cancer ovarian cancer so we don't ask her to stop ocps mammography at this age she's 37 years old you can't, you will not use mammography for breast cancer screening but this woman she has a family history of cancer of ovarian cancer breast cancer also so she could be carrying this genetic mutations involving the braca mutation she could be having hnpcc mu gene mutation so those genetic test testing needs to be done and if the genetic testing results come positive if she is known carrier of a genetic mutation then we think about offering risk reducing surgery so right now genetic testing will be required okay and similar question they had asked in neat pg that went by they had said a woman has a that, that 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 they had said that there is a cervical cancer history in a relative or cervical cancer history in mother then what is the concern for the daughter cervical cancer has no genetic so there is no genetic concern there right so if at all you want to prevent cervical cancer there is only one way for prevention of cervical cancer early diagnosis and treatment which involves screening and which involves hpv vaccination also no genetics there okay now let's come back to i want to start with this question yes a 24 year old primary gravida at 6 weeks of amenorrhea is diagnosed with left sided tubal ectopic her vitals are stable her serum beta hcg is 2500 international units per liter transvaginal sonography shows a left sided complex at nexal mass of 3 cm size she is complained compliant for follow up sorry this should be compliant she is compliant for follow up her baseline cbc lft kft reports are all normal im injection of methotrexate is given she is advised all of the following except except yes so they are asking you questions on medical management of ectopic yes they are asking you questions on medical management of ectopic 
and repeatedly they have asked so this is again one step ahead question from medical management of ectopic read this question you will realize that what is the criteria for medical management vital should be stable she should be compliant beta hcg level should be less than 5000 the mass size here is 3 cm it should be less than 4 cm you know that cardiac activity should be absent you know that we are doing a baseline cbc lft kft because if there is deranged liver function if there is deranged kidney function if there is severe anemia then methotrexate cannot be given it is a contraindication so you have to rule out the contraindications of methotrexate also one read up on the question all your contra all your criteria for medical management you remember she is advised all except Continue oral folic acid, avoid intercourse, repeat serum beta HCG on day 4, day 7, anti-D injection if she is RH negative, right? So, she is advised all except, you see she has an ectopic pregnancy and it is being medically managed. So, then during, there is also, there is always this potential of rupture. It's not true. It's not true that once we do the medical management, the, the ectopic cannot rupture. During the course of medical management, ectopic rupture could take place. Small shrinking ectopics could rupture. So, there is no guarantee. Okay. So, yes, woman is asked to avoid exertion. Woman is also asked to avoid intercourse as well. So, this is true. This is advised. Okay. Repeat serum beta HCG on day 4 and day 7. Very good. So, when we go for this intramuscular methotrexate injection, generally we go for single dose methotrexate therapy. Generally, we go for single dose methotrexate therapy and that was another question. Leucovorin need not be given. Leucovorin is given when we are going for multi-dose methotrexate therapy. So, leucovorin need not be given. Single dose methotrexate is given and the day the injection is given is day 0. A0 is the day the injection is given. Okay. Then we go for beta HCG on day 4. We have a beta HCG level done on day 0, the day we gave the injection. We have a beta HCG done on day 4. And we have a beta HCG done on day 7. Okay. Between day 0 and day 4. Between day 0 and day 4, there can be a slight increase in beta HCG also. So we don't consider that what we consider is between day 4 and day 7 we consider between day 4 and day 7 values of beta hcg between day 4 and day 7 values there should at least be 15 percent fall okay if they're falling by 15 percent then we keep following up every weekly to ensure that the beta hcg levels are falling if this fall is not there we may need to repeat the dose of beta hcg so, we ensure that at least 15% fall is happening. That's why day 4 and day 7 levels are important. If they are falling, continued beta HCG follow up weekly till levels become normal. If they are not falling, then we may have to repeat the dose of methotrexate if, if you want to stick to the medical management. Before calling it a failed medical management, one definitely likes to give at least 3 doses of methotrexate. So, repeat serum beta HCG on day 4, day 7, true statement. Anti-D injection, if she is RH negative, of course. If she is RH negative, then you have to give anti-D injection in ectopic pregnancy, whether it is being medically managed, whether it is being surgically managed. So, this is also a true statement. Continue folic acid is not a true statement. She is advised to stop oral folic acid. Methotrexate is a antifolate drug. It acts by targeting the folate reductase enzyme. Okay. So, when we have to give methotrexate, we avoid giving. We don't, we ask the woman to st stop taking oral folic acid. Keep that in mind. Okay. So, clinical management of ectopic pregnancy, we have discussed much of it. Okay. So, please remember that when we have a ruptured ectopic, you have to go with resuscitation and surgery that is salpingectomy. If the patient is stable, laparoscopy can be done. In an unstable patient, laparotomy is the only option. In an unruptured ectopic patient, we have to see medical management only done for stable, motivated, compliant patients. Okay, who are willing to follow up. 
then if the hcg is less than 5000 cardiac activity absence sac size less than 4 cm we can give methotrexate in an unruptured ectopic if the family is already complete there is no point of going this long route of medical management we go for surgical management if there's any contraindication to methotrexate medical management fail or the patient says that i can't come for follow up then of course surgical management is done even for an unruptured ectopic pregnancy and this surgery for unruptured ectopic pregnancy is going to be preferably done by laparoscopy in laparoscopy we can go for salpingectomy versus a salpingostomy salpingectomy is generally preferred if the other tube is absolutely healthy or let's say if the woman's family is complete she doesn't want to have any more children in the future then we go for salpingectomy salpingostomy is preferable if the other side tube which is uninvolved right so on one tube there is ectopic the other side tube looks very unhealthy thinking that you know maybe this tube i don't know if it will be able to work do that job of creating a pregnancy or no so if the other tube also looks unhealthy then salpingostomy is preferred so that is in summary about the method medical management of ectopic pregnancy now let's have, let's have a look at this question a very interesting question a 26 year old woman attends emergency with heavy vaginal bleeding and lower abdominal cramp for 4 hours. Her LMP was 6 weeks ago. UPT is positive. Okay, UPT is positive. LMP was 6 weeks ago. There is history of passage of fleshy mass from vagina in the toilet. There is no bleeding and pain now. Ultrasound shows an empty uterus with thick endometrium. At, sorry, at next size normal. What should be done next? Think and answer. It's very straightforward, slightly twisted. Think and answer. She has a history of heavy bleeding, cramps, something she passed in the toilet, and now there is no pain and bleeding. Ultrasound shows an empty uterus with thick endometrium. Adnexa is normal. What should be done next? I need your answers because I want to discuss this with you. So give me your options give me your answers yes d follow up after one week okay follow up after one week could be done could be done i don't say completely no for that any other thing any other thing complete abortion reassurance send home if you're wanting to follow up after one week that means yes if you if you're don't know from fleshy mass okay yes so the history is likely suggestive of a, uh, 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 suggestive of a complete approach. But what was this fleshy mass that was passed in the toilet? What do I know? What was passed? Was it a clot that was passed? Was it a decidual cast that was passed? It was a G's. What do I know? It was passed in the toilet. There is a history of fleshy mass. I don't deny it, but it could be anything. It could be a decidual cast. And then it could be been an ectopic pregnancy that I'm dealing with. But I, I can't relax and say, okay, you know, it's complete abortion because I don't know what was passed. So I can't say it is complete abortion reassurance send home. Please keep that in mind. Because, you know, I would be able to say complete abortion, let's say in the situation, patient could come and say, this is what I passed. She could bring the expelled contents. And only when we visibly see the chorionic villi, na, with our own eyes, grossly see the chorionic villi and we can float the chorionic villi in saline. They look very frondy, white, whitish, yellowish, feathery in appearance. Put them in normal saline, they float. We can always obviously confirm them on histopath also. But only when we visibly see these are chorionic villi, then I'll say yes, incomplete abortion. The second thing, she says that um, I pass this fleshy mass in the toilet and everything and uh, you know, let's say for example, uh, let's say for example in this particular case only in this particular let's say case she says that this is my ultrasound from one week ago it's six weeks now she says one week ago also i had done an ultrasound at that point there was a gestational sac now there is bleeding and now she has passed it in toilet now you have done the scan now you are seeing the uterus is empty it was earlier there it was there in a previous ultrasound report. Now it is not there and in between bleeding and fleshy mass passage happen. Then you can say it is incomplete abortion. For sure, then you can say it is incomplete abortion. In this situation here, I really can't 100% say that complete abortion reassure and send her home. I can't do that. Admit for suction evacuate. What, what is there in uterus is empty. Na? What to suction and evacuate? Out. Okay. 
follow up after one week is one option like you said doctor sir and the other is send a serum beta hcg okay you follow up after one week after one week now uh, what do you want to do after one week after one week she has started developing pain she was actually in ectopic pregnancy had passed a decidual cast had passed a decidual cast she was actually in ectopic pregnancy uh, and because when you saw her there was no pain and bleeding na so what degree of heavy bleeding we don't know maybe she did have some uh, 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 you know small ectopic pregnancy by the time one week gone by she came with ectopic pregnancy or even with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy so then it is a possibility then just calling her up for following up after one week is it is it is a risky proposition right it you might do it but i, I don't think i think better is to go for a serum beta hcg send a serum beta hcg 48 hours later you repeat it 48 hours later you repeat it and if it is actually an abortion case then serum beta hcg levels are going to dramatically fall okay it is going to fall more than 40% or 50% more than 50% in 48 hours it will fall definitely if it is a abortion case and moreover it has all been expelled the fall in uh, uh, beta hcg levels is also going to be much more faster so keep that in mind so serum beta hcg i say is better because if you call her up after follow up after one week and then decide to beta hcg then you can't go back in time and send beta serum beta hcg levels to analyze because we have to analyze serum beta hcg levels every 48 48 hours so i would like to send serum beta hcg right now so pregnancy of unknown location clinical profile may vary like in this particular case the clinical profile was going more in favor of incomplete abortion uh, sorry complete abortion but i was not 100% sure so the clinical profile can vary so you have to understand logically so pregnancy of unknown location amenorrhea patient could be very patient may be asymptomatic or she may have some pain some bleeding something which creates confusion whether it is abortion ectopic or whatever upt positive but the thing is that there is no gestational sac on transvaginal sonography do a serum beta hcg if it is more than 3500 international units per liter and yet there is no location of pregnancy seen it's most like an might likely an ectopic pregnancy medical management with methotrexate can be given straight away okay yes and we are talking about no gestational sac meaning no no true gestational sac of course we're not talking about a pseudo gestational sac here so basically there is no evidence of an intra uterine pregnancy particularly more importantly that is what we are trying to say here we don't know for sure that it is an intra uterine pregnancy now when your serum beta hcg levels are less than 3500 international units per liter then we go for serial serum beta hcg every 48 hours okay if the levels are falling dramatically 50% fall it's likely a failing intra uterine pregnancy we need to just follow up in that situation if the levels are rising rising doubling levels right it's likely a healthy intra uterine pregnancy we keep following up we'll repeat a tvs once the levels are reaching 3500 international units per liter we'll be able to see an intra uterine pregnancy if there is one if by that time we are not able to see an intra uterine pregnancy then it will go here then medical management as ectopic can be given just like here it will go here okay and if there are plateauing levels plateauing levels of beta hcg then it is more likely an ectopic now see more likely mark my words more likely an ectopic but it could be anything it could be a slow growing intra uterine pregnancy it could be a failing intra uterine pregnancy i don't know but yeah it does definitely look like an ectopic so i follow up keep on follow up repeat tvs if no gestational sac is there you know i should at least have three values of beta hcg to compare with so at least three values are required if at all you know i still need to confirm i can go for a dnc on a dnc if i see chorionic villi which are going to float in saline i'll say it is a failed intra uterine pregnancy if there are no chorionic villi it can be medically managed as an ectopic pregnancy and further confirmation see the histopath report of these chorionic villi are going to come much later 
uh, it takes about three days to for the histopath report to come back right so this visual examination of the chorionic villi we are going to do and we are going to try to float them in saline so remember that chorionic villi are going to float in saline okay so visible evidence will be taken and then people also argue what of what what of that rare chance when it's a heterotopic pregnancy what if the rare chance when it's a pregnancy is in the uterus also pregnancy is in the tube also what if it is a heterotopic pregnancy i say i have done the dnc i have seen the chorionic villi i'll follow up with beta hcg after another 40 a dnc i do 48 hours later i do beta hcg if the beta hcg are falling i know it was an intrauterine pregnancy only not a heterotopic pregnancy because had it been a heterotopic pregnancy hcg levels would not have fallen down dramatically so follow up follow up beta hcg very very important okay so with this we complete the chart so i have guided you if the chart is going to be there with you i'm going to send you this pdf also so chart is there to guide you but please understand that the clinical profile don't you don't analyze the beta hcg results in isolation okay you analyze the patient as the whole the patient's profile as the as a whole keep that in mind okay and let's have a look at the last two questions of the day the last two questions of the day and then we'll get over how can we differentiate between intrauterine pregnancy and ectopic pregnancy clinical ultrasound is mandatory before mtp and ectopic okay clinical would be <coughs> clinical would be in intrauterine pregnancy uterus is going to be enlarged ectopic pregnancy uterus is going to be normal size even in a topic pregnancy the clinical findings can absolutely be normal we may not be able to feel an adnexal mass all right ultrasound can help us see the location of pregnancy if it is an intrauterine pregnancy or there is an adnexal mass most of the times in a topic pregnancy the the ultrasound findings are simply that of a complex adnexal mass right Hundred percent diagnosis would be that if we see a gestational sac in the location of the adnexa, but that is less commonly seen. So most of the times, it is the entire clinical profile that we take into consideration, right? And in certain situations where we cannot make the diagnosis between clinic between intrauterine pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy, before going for MTP, before going for medical management of ectopic, it is very very important to find out where exactly is the pregnancy. Like you rightly said. one has to go for the beta hcg levels right in case ectopic given medical abortion in case ectopic given medical abortion that is why it is very very important to see na baba clinical examination uterus will be enlarged in abortion cases before giving abortion right and if you have any doubts ultrasound will help you confirm if ultrasound is not telling you information it will go along this direction pregnancy of unknown location okay fine i will not give medical abortion to a patient before knowing the exact location of pregnancy i will not do that okay so if it is see looking like a pregnancy of unknown location i will not generally like to go for medical abortion straight away now next question a 30 year old woman has come to gynae opd with complaint of abnormal hair growth over face and breasts progressing over the past 6 months she has not had periods for past 3 months her pregnancy test is negative her physical examination is unremarkable what test would you like to perform what test would you like to perform yes as has already answered straight away it is she is having uh, you know she is having her suitism and that hirsutism look at this age 30 year old hirsutism you know and progressing over the past 6 months so something that is new something that is new in onset something that is progressing very fastly she is not even had a period so past 3 months pregnancy test is negative physical examination you have not found any things so best thing to do here would be progesterone challenge test ke bajaye progesterone challenge test ke bajaye in this situation yes you could as go for a progesterone challenge test to induce a withdrawal bleeding that's fine 
the, the question they are asking you here is basically to arrive at a diagnosis. Okay, so in this situation, first go for serum testosterone. The progesterone challenge test that you are giving is giving you give, going going to give it to induce withdrawal bleeding. You can do that, but most important in the presence of evident hirsutism, yar, it evident hirsutism. Please test for what you are looking at. Okay, what you are looking at is excess of androgen. Go for a serum testosterone, particularly for the age of the woman also, when this is something that has happened all new. Had this woman been, you know, young uh, and she have, would have a history suggestive of PCOS, like, you know, menstrual disturbances or slowly this, this mild hair growth happening over a period of many years since menarche, only the problem was there. A clinical profile, if, if it would have been suggestive of PCOS, then I may not have done a serum testosterone to begin with. Okay, that may not have been my first investigation, but here it becomes the first investigation. Why? You see the difference. The difference is the profile is not that of a PCOS patient. In a PCOS patient, I know the clinical profile is such, I know the testosterone will be mildly elevated. But here, presenting something for the first time at the age of 30 year old, progressing over the past six months. So it deserves more attention right maybe there's something other than pcos so when you have moderate to severe hirsutism moderate to severe hirsutism okay when the ferriman galloway scoring which is a scoring system for hirsutism is more than eight in clinical practice it is just judged by clinical appearance and many times patients don't come with their full full fledged hirsutism appearance in the opd we can ask them how often they use hair removal creams and everything that kind of information can be get frequent use of hair removal creams and everything so moderate to severe hirsutism serum testosterone should be done first if it is more than 150 nanogram per deciliter that is too high in pcos patients usually the levels are less than 150 Ultrasound pelvis should definitely be done. Maybe there is an ovarian tumor which is secreting androgens. Okay, maybe uh, we should also look for adrenal gland evaluation as well. Maybe it's an adrenal gland tumor which is secreting androgens. Keep that in mind. Okay, maybe there's an adrenal gland tumor. Okay, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is very unlikely in this young age. Let me also point that out to you. Uh, at this age of 30, if there would have been a congenital adrenal hyperplasia, serum hydroxyprogesterone is raised in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The non-classical form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia presents at puberty or maybe with precocious pubertal development. Age is going against the diagnosis of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Okay, sometimes women with uh, hyperprolactinemia can also have, uh, you know, hirsutism. So, serum prolactin, I would definitely like to do. Okay, I would li like to do a full hormonal profile workup as well. But most important hormone to do here would be serum testosterone. Keep that in mind. Okay, so if there is no ovarian tumor that is identified, then we focus on the adrenal gland evaluation. Adrenal gland tumors are extremely, extremely rare if the serum testosterone level is less than 150 but severe hirsutism is there severe hirsutism is there rapidly progressive acute is hirsutism is there then please go for ultrasound pelvis and please rule out any ovarian tumor as well in mild hirsutism chronic slow progressive hirsutism cases right with less than 150 nanogram per deciliter of testosterone it is most likely pcos and then the profile would be of that of a PCOS patient, okay? Clinical profile would also be important, right? So this is about management or pro, uh, how to approach uh, which test to do in a hirsutism patient. Treatment management is going to be management of cause, right? And the other thing that we are going to go for is symptom control. So the drug of choice is going to be beginning with oral contraceptive pills. They are much safer and for mild to mild hirsutism cases, they work very, very, very well. Second line drugs. So these are the first line drugs. These are the first line drugs. Then we can have second line drugs like anti-androgenic drugs. Anti-androgenic drugs like, you know, spironolactone, finasteride, flutamide, right? Now these are all anti-androgenic drugs. So please keep them in mind that if a woman is trying to get pregnant, 
ओके शी इज इन द रिप्रोडक्टिव एज ग्रुप ना इफ शी इज ट्राइंग टू गेट प्रेगनेंट देन दीज एंटी एंड्रोजेनिक ड्रग्स दे कैन क्रॉस द प्लेसेंटा एंड दे विल हार्म द फ्यूटस इन दे विल हार्म द मेल फ्यूटस इज इंट इट बिकॉज दीज आर एंटी एंड्रोजेनिक ड्रग्स सो इन दैट सिचुएशन इफ अ वुमन इज ट्राइंग टू गेट प्रेगनेंट शी इज इन द रिप्रोडक्टिव एज ग्रुप ऑलवेज टेल अर दैट वी आर स्टार्टिंग यू ऑन एंटी एंड्रोजेनिक ड्रग्स सो शी शुड बी ऑल्सो स्टार्टेड विद ओरल कॉन्ट्रोसेप्टिव pills so these androgen anti androgenic drugs are given together with oral contraceptive pills for contraception because we don't want a situation where the woman gets pregnant and then she can have a male fetus whose development is abnormal then gnra channel locks can be used gnra channel locks are going to suppress the production of uh, ovarian production of hormones so they can also be used right cosmetic treatment are always there and wherever possible we try to go for treatment of cause management of cause like if it's an ovarian tumor that needs to be excised if it's an adrenal gland tumor that needs to be removed right so keep that in mind now let's have a look at this question Which of the following is incorrect regarding management of diabetic woman during labor? Previous year I N I C E T question. Previous year I N I C E T question. Which of the following is incorrect regarding management of diabetic woman during labor? Yes. Her nighttime dose of insulin and morning dose of insulin are given as usual. Regular insulin given by IV infusion pump. Capillary blood glucose levels are maintained at approximately hundred milligram per deciliter. Elective LSCS does not decrease the incidence of brachial plexus injury in the newborn. The elective LSCS, if really elective LSCS, if really would have decreased the incidence of brachial plexus injury in the newborn, we would have done it for everybody, but it doesn't. even with a macrosomic baby it doesn't because see when we say macrosomia na we are checking for the ultrasound estimated fetal weight which is plus minus 500 grams here and there it is uh, ultrasound estimations are also not 100% accurate so doing elective cesarean all the time to decrease brachial plexus injury in the newborn will mean that we will have to do so many cesarean sections to maybe prevent one incidence of brachial plexus injury in the newborn moreover during the cesarean section also when we are delivering the baby out by that cesarean incision on the uterus at that point in time also brachial plexus injury in the newborn can happen so elective cesarean section does not decrease the incidence of brachial plexus injury that is a true statement that is a true statement okay now regular insulin is given by iv infusion pump that makes sense See, in the entire labor uh process in the, during the entire labor duration we have to maintain blood sugar control so we have to give regular insulin which can only be given iv best way to give it is by iv infusion pump so that repeated injections need not be given we are maintaining we are you know checking the blood sugar levels every hourly to two hourly every one hour to two hour we checking the blood sugar levels and to titrate like that we'll have to give so many times right it is better to give iv iv infusion pump so this is true and the goal is to maintain the capillary blood glucose levels at approximately about 100 mg per deciliter we don't have to cause hyperglycemia and we don't have to cause hypoglycemia so that is also a true statement her night time dose of insulin and morning dose of insulin are given as usual that is wrong she takes the night time dose of insulin but morning dose of the insulin is omitted morning dose of insulin is omitted keep that in mind okay so that is an important pointer here because see she is going to be in labor she is not going to eat that much now right she may need an emergency cesarean section at any point in time she may need anesthesia at any point in time so she can't be full stomach there right anyway she is going to eat less as compared to what she was eating a day before so you can't start her with a by giving her a morning dose of dose of insulin because that is going to be maybe intermediate acting or long acting you don't want that you want to titrate the blood sugar levels during the course of labor by checking and maintaining blood sugar levels within the normal range by regular insulin infusion right so you don't want any pre existing long acting or intermediate acting insulin effect during the time of 
लेबर तो मॉर्निंग डोज इज ओमिटेड कीप दैट इन माइंड दैट्स एन इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंटर ना आई गिव यू वन मोर पॉइंटर हियर द पॉइंटर हियर इज आफ्टर डिलीवरी यू टेल मी आफ्टर डिलीवरी वट विल हैपन आफ्टर डिलीवरी यू टेल मी वट विल हैपन टू हर इंसुलिन रिक्वायरमेंट यू टेल मी आफ्टर डिलीवरी वट विल हैपन टू हर इंसुलिन रिक्वायरमेंट यस what will happen to the insulin requirement hyperglycemia kai ko why 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 hyperglycemia i'm talking about insulin requirement she was she was she is already a diabetic woman she was on insulin you man, managed her labor also after delivery will you restart the insulin in the same dosage as she was during pregnancy in pregnancy insulin requirement increases even if there is a woman who is a known diabetic or let's say for example for somebody whom we started on insulin in the second trimester as her pregnancy is going to advance as the insulin resistance during pregnancy is going to increase her insulin requirement will also increase we see that okay insulin requirement will also increase in labor also yes you are right stress on the so, yes insulin requirement increases during pregnancy but after delivery after delivery she will not require the same dosages of insulin the uh, the, the hormones that are called responsible for the insulin resistance in pregnancy those hormones are withdrawing now placenta is out placental hormones those hormones are withdrawing now after delivery her insulin requirement will decrease keep that in mind so we don't start her on the same dosages what she was taking before going into labor of course she maybe she has got gotten a cesarean section done and then she's she's not yet started eating and na to insulin to tabhi when we'll give na when she when she's 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 on her full diet and even when she's on her full diet she may not need the same amount of insulin that she was needing earlier maybe it may be less so it needs to be titrated again keep that in mind okay so that's an important pointer and last question i always keep saying last question and then i remember one question last question yes last question definitely last question 37 year old woman presented at 8 weeks of gestation with ultrasound suggestive of missed abortion suction and evacuation was done sent for histopath histopath report raises suspicion of molar pregnancy okay and the pathologist wants to perform additional tests all of the following can help in definitive diagnosis except now look here okay when when i discuss with you complete mole versus partial mole okay i tell you all the differences you read all the differences in books okay now analyze it clinically all of the following can help in definitive diagno how can you definitely say i mean it could be a partial molar pregnancy which is often misdiagnosed as missed abortion have you heard this in your lectures partial molar pregnancy is often misdiagnosed as missed abortion hai na particularly when the diagnosis is made in early gestation so histopath report is raising a suspicion he is not sure the pathologist wants to do additional tests on the tissue on the tissue that you have sent for histopath pathologist wants to do additional tests that's another clue all of the following can help in definitive diagnosis except except definitive diagnosis definitive diagnosis see serum beta hcg levels may be giving you an idea okay because molar pregnancies are associated with higher levels of beta hcg as compared to what happens in the normal pregnancy but this is so early on in pregnancy now see you know what when you read when 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 i was a post graduate na and when I, when i was an undergraduate student at that time we used to read that the most common clinical presentation of molar pregnancy was in the second trimester with bleeding and all that right now see times have changed okay with this availability of ultrasound with ultrasounds being done early or in pregnancy more and more for more, maybe for diagnosis of pregnancy maybe for um, uh, gestational age estimation or for whatever reason or maybe for aneuploidy screening 
we are more and more picking up molar pregnancies much early on in pregnancy where the characteristic histopath features may not be there on the removed tissue that is why there is this concern and maybe it is so early on in pregnancy that maybe the maternal serum beta hcg levels are not clearly very high as well okay maybe you've not done those serum beta hcg levels only and now you've already now we've already done a suction evacuation so i'll get get, get a beta hcg report which is much lower than what was earlier so i really don't think maternal serum beta hcg levels can help in a definitive diagnosis because i've already done a suction and evacuation had i done one earlier maybe then okay i've already done a suction and evacuation so now beta hcg levels i'm going to get get low only so this is not going to help however dna ploidy status of the tissue p57 kip2 immunostaining and molecular genotyping i'll tell you what molecular genotyping is all right so these are what is going to help us in definitive diagnosis so i have this flow chart for you here you can refer to it later in a complete mole we have all read uh, all read that there is no maternal dna okay it is deployed no maternal dna it is deployed and both the uh, uh, both the chromosomal material is coming from the male partner right so diandric so molecular genotyping will help us with that okay to find diandric or digynic or you know monogynic so basically about the a fact whether it is a maternal dna whether it is a paternal dna molecular genotyping will help with that and in complete mole p57 kip2 immunostaining is negative partial mole as well as hydropic abortion partial mole as well as hydropic abortion they both have maternal dna they both are p57 kip2 immunostaining positive but partial mole are going to be triploid and hydropic abortions are going to be diploid so that's your distinction between complete mole versus partial mole versus hydropic abortion okay so the pathologist got confused whether it is a partial mole whether it is a hydropic abortion that is why he was asking for additional tests so he could we could he could request for p57 kip2 immunostaining uh, molecular genotyping and dna ploidy status that would help but maternal serum beta hcg levels will not provide a definitive confirmation right or a definitive diagnosis so with this we complete the lecture okay and to inform you that there is an ini grant test also on coming uh, 30th april 1st may 2nd may we have ini grant test okay please keep giving the grant test they are very important the instagram facebook and youtube links are provided and uh, join us on our telegram channel also all the links are provided in the chat box also and uh, the pdf will be shared in the telegram group so do not worry about that as well and s ka koi ek question has been left what was the question s i ICT negative antidi, ICT negative antidi क्यों देते हैं? ICT negative meaning she does not have her oh she has she is not yet sensitized. She is not yet sensitized. She is not yet formed antidi antibodies of her own. Then we give antidi injection to prevent maternal sensitization. Okay, okay. We give anti D injection in case maternal fetal meta, fetal maternal hemorrhage will take place. Fetal RBCs we have already given anti D. Fetal RBCs will be blocked by the anti D that we have given. And now these fetal RBCs will not be able to evoke or incite an immune response in the mother. That is the logic of giving anti D to women who are ICT negative. They are not yet sensitized. if she is icd positive that means she already has anti d antibodies she, her immune system has already synthesized anti d antibodies maybe because of a prior pregnancy maybe because of a prior history of blood transfusion prior abortion or for whatever reason she is already sensitized then you don't need to then we don't need to give it's a waste if we give icd positive if we give it is a waste if she is already ic ict positive then the focus is on identifying the titers 
and once the critical titers of 1 is to 16 are crossed then we start testing for early detection of fetal anemia okay so with this we finish off the lecture i wish you all the best of you guys who are going to appear for your ini cet all right this was session was to give you an extra edge from the commonly asked around questions i i hope that you perform well and you do well think logically think conceptually rule out options look out for look for key pointers in your questions right that is the key thank you so much i will stop streaming now